the experience of nothingness. Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj's Talks on Realizing the Infinite, edited by Robert Powell. Short Preface These conversations with visitors of all kinds, which took place in the final year of his life, were exclusively directed at the goal of awakening or self realization. Nisargadatta Maharaj talked with visitors until the very day of his death of cancer at September 8, 1981, at the age of 84. Chapter 1 Maharaj sets out the basics of the teaching. Maharaj, the nature of the consciousness has to be understood. This consciousness can arise only in the physical body, and the physical body is the essence of the five elements. It is because of the association with the physical body that there is suffering. Most people who come here will not be able to accept this type of knowledge because it is on a strictly fundamental level. But some persons who apply themselves and can accept such a point of view will really understand. They will be totally free from the impact of pain and unhappiness if they understand that the latter can only result from the consciousness which has identified itself with the physical body and suffers as an individual. In that case, suffering must inevitably result. But what is the individual? There is a body created out of the five elements, and in that body dwells the vital breath prana and the consciousness. It is a composite unity. All living forms contain the vital breath and the consciousness. And although the forms are different, they all contain the same elements. So I ask again, where is the question of an individual? Basically, there is none. And this is my basic teaching which has to be grasped, but only very few will understand. Visitor, would you please repeat this? There was so much disturbance that I could not follow it. Maharaj, certainly, but not in the same words. Now what is it that we are concerned with? We are dealing with the physical form which is made up of and fed by the five elements. In that form are operating the life force the vital breath and this consciousness, that is, the knowledge I am or the sense of being, the sense of existence. The latter is the sentience, which is the gift of the consciousness. This is the total that we can perceive, the body, the vital breath, and the consciousness. All forms are made of the same components. So where is the question of an individual? Throughout all this, the individual as such has never come into being. And for this reason, there is no need to identify oneself with anything. Yet one does. The consciousness identifies itself with the body, and in this way the individual comes into being. So long as this is a fact, that individual is bound to suffer. And what I am, I am neither the body, which is merely the five elements, nor the life force, the breath, nor the consciousness which comes into the body. I must identify with the consciousness as long as the body is there, because it forms one unity with it. But in actuality, I am none of these three things. While the body exists, I am the consciousness, which merely witnesses whatever is going on. When the body dies, the life force leaves and mingles with the air, and the consciousness mingles with the universal consciousness. I am essentially nothing identifiable in this consciousness, being only its witness. And what I am in the absolute sense, it is not possible to convey in any words. In that ultimate awareness, nobody has any consciousness of being present. The presence itself is not there in the absolute. No person not interested in the subject would want to come here. So one can only assume that those who do attend are vitally interested in the subject and have done their homework. Thus the people who come here are all Johnnies. But how many amongst us know the nature and the basis of this consciousness that I am, which exists so long as the body is there? Each of us must say I am and realize it. There is no you, and there is no me as individual entities. When there is an imbalance in the body's substance, illness comes about. But when that material is in perfect balance, there is no illness. Now how is that? The question was, 
Does the universal consciousness depend on the five elements for its existence? The answer to this question is that the universal consciousness and the total manifestation appear simultaneously. The manifestation happens because consciousness is there. Until the I am thought was there, there was no manifestation. Both came about simultaneously. But because we identify ourselves with the body in which the individual consciousness manifests itself, and the consciousness in order to manifest itself has to have a form, the individual is born and that individual suffers. Earlier I had explained the question of the universal consciousness. The universal consciousness is something like a name given to a city. Now there is Bombay, for example. What do you mean by Bombay? Can you produce Bombay? No. The totality of a particular thing is designated, so the universal consciousness is merely a name given to that which is formless. I use the word city, not particularly Bombay. I mean any city or place. If I say Bombay, it means that I refer to a limited area. Visitor, a very important point here. To my mind, a city or a nation comprises only the individuals who make it up. Maharaj, a name may have been given by individuals, but that which has been created, has man created it. Out of five elements man is born. But has man created the five elements? The five elements have been created out of that consciousness, which is in the individual body. Visitor, the universal consciousness and this consciousness within me, are they the same? Maharaj, the light which is perceived by your eyes and the light which is generally seen as reflected in various manifestations, are they different? To repeat, the whole problem lies in identification with the individual body and consequently with the individual. Therefore, the individual is ever afraid of death, death of the individual. Are there any questions on this subject? You are this consciousness. And out of this consciousness is born the entire universe. We consider ourselves as individuals, and that which is unlimited we have limited to an insignificant thing. The infinite is narrowed down to a single body. That is our whole problem. Now there is also this question. If it is the same universal consciousness that appears in millions of human beings, why do they act in such contrary manners, creating all kinds of chaos? If one woman has ten children, they are all born from the same parents, but do they not act in remarkably contrary ways? Why is that? Because although constituted from the same basic five elements, the composition of each individual, resulting from different proportions, permutations and combinations of these elements, is quite different. Thus each person acts in a different way. Or to use a different analogy, the metal may be the same but the purposes for which that metal has been converted into different instruments are widely different, each instrument may be used for a particular purpose. So the ingredients are the five elements, but the eventual object created from different combinations of those ingredients is bound to act uniquely according to its composition. Visitor, whose purpose is it Maharaj? Maharaj, the purpose is the addition of all these millions of combinations. Until I know, that is why I asked earlier when do we first know the nature and basis of this composition, which we identify as ourselves. Unless I first thoroughly know its nature, how can I know the purpose and basis of the entire universe? Interpreter, Maharaj is asking you, have you realized the nature of the consciousness? Now he gives an example, as is his want of country, homely nature. In the country they make a pancake. There is a fire, they put a pan on it, and then the dough is poured on it. Finally the pancake comes into being and is removed. When the next one is put into the pan, when it is formed, it will generally appear like the previous one, but the number of dents and holes in the two will not be exactly the same. You may have dozens of these pancakes but each one is bound to be different. 
That is the nature of creation itself, to have variety. So he says, understand the nature and basis of that which is created as the manifestation, and that is the consciousness. Unless you understand this consciousness, no other way of realizing Paramatman exists. It cannot be attained other than by understanding. Maharaj, the mystery of the hypnotic power of this Meyer is that one identifies oneself with the body. And the mechanism of this kind of identification does not differ in any way from identification of a chunk of stone or something created out of stone as God and the wholehearted worshipping of it. So far as that goes, it is all right, and this kind of worship will have its normal effects in consciousness. But unless the nature of the consciousness is understood, one will not be able to understand one's true identity. Then having understood the nature of the consciousness, you will also understand that you are not the consciousness. Anything that you have seen and understood, you cannot be. You as a subject can only understand something which is an object, and you are bound to accept it as such. If you discuss things with me based on the traditional literature and the traditional knowledge, there will be so many pundits who are so knowledgeable they will eat me alive. And yet, where the basic knowledge is concerned, which I deal with, why do these people remain speechless? Because it is something totally different from anything that can be understood. Whatever is understood, whatever is seen, is not true. Any questions? Visitor, there is a hymn to creation. It is well known to people who have read the translations. At the end of that, the poem goes something like this, I can only vaguely reproduce it. He the ultimate knower, the Johnny, the question now is who said this whole thing, who caused him? It is about the Johnny's origin, how did that happen? And in the last line, the poem reads, he the Johnny, he knows it. Or perhaps he knows not. In other words, you are left in doubt at the end whether he really knows the ultimate. The true? Maharaj, would you repeat it, please? Visitor, well, it is difficult to do so without repeating the actual text. In other words, it is an ultimate question about, so to speak, the origin of the Jani. He says it in the last line. Maharaj, but how does it start this into creation? Visitor, it is a very well-known hymn. What about the origin of the Jani himself? You can imagine the Johnny asking himself, How did I come to be here? The answer he gives is, He knows. Or perhaps he does not know it either. Maharaj, he cannot be called a Johnny since the very question is not answered, the problem is still incomplete, unsolved. The mystery remains. The sick man is still a sick man. Whatever he says is an echo of illness and the one who wrote it is still ill. Visitor asks a question in Marathi which is not translated. Maharaj, consciousness itself is the screen. This is the realm of consciousness and all creations are in the consciousness. Interpreter, the question was, could we conceive of consciousness as a screen on which the entire creation is like a moving picture? So Maharaj said initially, there is no screen, there is nothing. Whatever is, is wide open. Then, Mr. P explained that what the lady probably intended to convey is that anything that can happen, all thoughts, all action, are only appearances in that consciousness. So Maharaj said, undoubtedly, the session is nearly over. Are there any questions? Maharaj wants questions, he thrives on them. Visitor, a difficulty in our understanding is that consciousness itself is the object of the knower, right? This consciousness can eventually be understood by the jhani. Unfortunately, the opposite of consciousness is unconsciousness. So in the language, so to speak, there is an inbuilt tendency to make this division consciousness and unconsciousness. Consciousness is being understood, and then what remains, according to the language, is unconsciousness. Interpreter, that he explained yesterday morning. When the consciousness is not there, 
then obviously one is unconscious. So what are you getting at? Visitor, consciousness is not true. You say that to the ordinary person, and then that seems an inferior state to him. Second visitor, it does not seem inferior to me. Maharaj, it is out of unconsciousness that consciousness is born. Unconsciousness is the source. And that is our experience also. This knowledge I am. This consciousness has come out of the prior state when there was no consciousness. The consciousness is a state which is now with us and because of which we suffer. And before this consciousness came, a state prevailed when we were not conscious and which was a happy state. The session is over but if there are any questions, then go ahead. There are no further questions, Maharaj, in response to a question about effort to understand. There is no question of any efforts being made by anyone. That which is is to be understood, is self-effulgent. It does not need anybody's help to exist, and is merely to be understood. And when it is understood, it will also be clear that I am the dawn, I am the afternoon. I am the evening, I am the night. I am the good, I am the bad. And what is to be understood is that if consciousness is not there, the world is not there. And I am not the consciousness, I am apart from it. Although consciousness is so very important, for if there were no consciousness there would be no world, there would be nothing, yet I am not that. Visitor, but even coming to this insight requires effort. Why does Maharaj say there is no effort to be made? Maharaj, now that you know that you are, you are sitting here, you know that you exist, you have that sentience. The knowledge that you are alive, that you exist, do you understand it through any effort? Visitor, no. Maharaj, your question is wholly correct from the point of view of this world, that is, unless you work there is no fruit you can't eat. So from the worldly point of view, your question is correct. But I don't belong to this world. And in the world, this I am Ness is just there without any efforts on anyone's part. Visitor, Maharaj, I am a teacher by profession. In theory, I accept this fully and even see the logic of it. The problem is that knowing this theoretically is one thing, but actually being it and feeling it is quite another. And that is where the trouble lies, and hence the need for effort. Maharaj, yes tremendous effort, being very very still and not doing anything. That is effort, the effort which you made when you were in your mother's womb for eight months and in which state neither your parents nor you as such did anything. No effort was made. Whatever grew grew by itself. Visitor, I got my answer. Maharaj, from the drop of semen at conception to the growing into a baby and his further development, what is it that made possible this growth? That very same principle which from the absence of knowledge has led to the presence of knowledge, this I am Ness that is what one is and what is to be understood. Visitor, a spontaneous occurrence without effort. Maharaj, that spontaneous happening, that consciousness which has come upon unconsciousness. Visitor, but how can one know that conception has occurred? Second visitor, how otherwise would you know the child is born? Visitor, unless there is conception he will not grow. And in the person where there is no conception there will be no growth. Hence an effort would also have to be made for there to be conception, then only the growth will take place. Interpreter, Maharaj is telling you exclusively about the growth part. There are no efforts. It is spontaneously happening the growth. Maharaj, even there, even for the conception, what effort could the parents make? And even if the parents make that effort, could they have guaranteed that conception is to take place? The conception occurs by itself of its own sweet will, not necessarily because of any efforts. In any case, the efforts which the parents made were not really efforts. They were enjoying themselves. That is not an effort as such. To a particular visitor, are you coming in the evening? Visitor, these are my sisters. They are going back with me this afternoon. Maharaj, 
the knowledge you are if you want to remember this visit, remember this also the memory that you are is under the shade, that is, the protecting umbrella of the Kiru or God, worshipping God and Kiru means worshipping the knowledge you are only. So hold on to that principle, the knowledge I am. The knowledge that you exist and worship it in the name of your Kiru or God. Chapter 2 At the highest level nothing is, at the worldly level everything is. Visitor, forgive me for going back to what Maharaj said yesterday because I forgot. I asked him about the presence of the Guru, and he said there is something saying Guru Guru Guru. Maharaj, oh yes Guru means that I am Ness itself which always reminds you I am I am. I am that is Guru 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 like the sound of a motor car starting. It is a continuous reminder that you are. For this trifling talk, why are you using this equipment? Referring to the tape recorder, visitor, because the trifling talk takes us back all the time to that which is not trifling. Maharaj, just so. Visitor, can I ask a question? Maharaj, of course. Visitor, this morning Maharaj said this mystery of the knower and the known should be followed up. The known is not really known by a knower. The known is known because its perceptions, thoughts, feelings, are movements in consciousness, and they are known because of their appearance in the light of consciousness. Is that correct? Maharaj, it is just like that. A Johnny is the most stupid. He is not concerned with knowing in the conventional sense. When this waking state, this consciousness appears, then only everything appears. Prior to that, where is the question of knowledge, ignorance, or jhana? Visitor, but deep sleep is that really a state? Maharaj, yes, the integral combination of waking state, deep sleep, and the dream state comprises I am. Visitor, but in deep sleep there is no time. Maharaj, time is there, only the witnessing of time is not there. Visitor, how can there be time if there is no witnessing? Maharaj, your watch did the witnessing job and told you that you were asleep for eight hours. Visitor, so witnessing comes afterwards. Maharaj, agreed. Visitor, in the deep sleep itself there is no time. Maharaj, the one that tells you later what is he like before telling you. Visitor, formless. Maharaj, when it is formless, when the form is not available, the consciousness I am is not there either. Visitor, so in deep sleep there is no I am. Maharaj, no. But the witnessing of deep sleep does happen. The principle that witnesses the deep sleep does not sleep. Visitor, I don't understand that something can be timeless and yet exist, the deep sleep. Maharaj, you go into a very deep samadhi then you will realize that. If you want to meet a state of nothingness, you yourself must also go into a state of nothingness. Visitor, that is what I call omnipresence or presence. Maharaj, I am Ness's presence. That I am Ness presence should not be there. The non, I am Ness only can meet that nothingness. Visitor, still there is, I have no word for it. Maybe presence is the right word. There is no thought, no feeling. There is. Maharaj, no thought, no feeling. Visitor, I used to go into samadhis which were just like deep sleep. In three hours or so, I noticed that many things had happened in my immediate environment. But my guru was very unhappy with that. He said, you must not do that. Maharaj, samadhi and the experiencer of samadhi. Did you get equated with both aspects, samadhi and the one who enjoyed samadhi? Visitor, now so many years later I say they are identical. Maharaj, okay the experiencer and the experience are one and the same. Visitor, but it cannot be remembered. Maharaj, it is not to be memorized, it cannot be grasped by memory. The manifest dynamic, fluid Brahman cannot be caught in any words. Visitor, can you say that everything, even ignorance and pain, is a pointer to the ultimate? 
Maharaj, when you are completely depersonified, you are no more an individual than whatever is is an embellishment or a decoration or a puja to the Parabrahman. But so long as you are wrapped up egoistically through some words, no puja can happen. Visitor, knowledge with a capital K, the ultimate knowledge. Maharaj, the absolute. Visitor, yes, knowingness. I don't know how to call it. Maharaj, but that is no knowingness. In the absolute, there is no knowingness. Knowingness is only in the past. Visitor, here we face the difficulty of words. Maharaj, you better not call it knowledge. Visitor, pure consciousness. Maharaj, in that state there is no knowingness. Visitor, but no unconsciousness either. It is not possible. Maharaj, it is unconscious. Visitor, from the point of view of the mind. Maharaj, yes because you are. The indication is given with reference to consciousness. That is why you call it no consciousness. Visitor, yes. But in reality from its own point of view. Maharaj, you are talking of the absolute. There is no I amness. Visitor, I don't know how to call it. Maharaj, call it absolute. The moment you say knowledge, the quality comes in. Visitor, I don't mean that. Maharaj, you are talking of the Nirguna state? Visitor, I don't know this Sanskrit term. Maharaj, Guna means I am Ness. And Nirguna means no I am Ness. Visitor, I am disappears in the absolute. Maharaj, yes a non-knowing state. Visitor, a non-knowing state that knows. Laughter. Maharaj, knowingness appears on the non-knowing state. Visitor, yes the relative beingness is known, is recorded in the absolute. Maharaj, beingness comes on the background of the absolute. So? Visitor, so it is known in the absolute. Beingness is known as an object. Maharaj, if knowingness is not known, who would call it knowingness? Visitor, there is nobody to call it anything. Maharaj, that is the reply. Visitor, so have I understood it right this morning. Maharaj advises us to find out who is the witness in deep sleep. Maharaj, all these wordy statements are just to please somebody. Actually, there is no substance in all this. Visitor, so no advice? Maharaj, the manifest dynamic nature, don't stamp it with words. Just be. Don't conceptualize. Now everybody is weighed down by words. Suppose a child is there and the child is dead. Whatever that principle, that dynamic principle has left the body. No, you cannot say what that dynamic principle is. It has no name now. Because of this association with the body, you have tried to capture it with words. Visitor, so words are the only problem. Maharaj, yes. The whole problem is with the words. Since that principle which has quit the body is now freed from the body, you cannot capture it through words. The dynamic beingness principle, because of its association with the body, embracing a certain form and certain words and concepts, is suffering. Without that, without form and without words, how can it suffer? Visitor, all this stops immediately when you see it as a puja to the ultimate. Maharaj, that means all this wordy business stops. You may understand it that way. Once you understand that you are not the body nor that you are wrapped up in name and form, and that you are this manifest Brahman only, you are free. Visitor, even the idea I am not free is part of the puja. Maharaj, what do you mean by puja? Puja is a process or an aid to propitiate somebody. Visitor, well, okay, would you call it Darishma? Maharaj, call it whatever you like. It is an expression of it. Visitor, it is consciousness playing with its own. Maharaj, yes. To a newly arrived visitor, if you are going to sit here, you must ask questions. You are not going to ask questions, take the rearmost seat. 
Visitor, if you come here you must stick out your neck. Otherwise it is no use being here. Maharaj, if you enter the arena you must fight with questions. Second visitor, of course, of course. Maharaj, pointing to a third visitor, for years he has been trying to assimilate knowledge but he has not got an iota of knowledge. What knowledge did you get? Visitor, the ignorant man has not got any knowledge and the sage has not got knowledge. Then what is the difference? Maharaj, the ignorant one has to acquire knowledge because knowledge is valid for the ignorant. For the jhani there is no sense of knowledge because he dismisses knowledge as unreal. Therefore he does not entertain knowledge. That is why he has no knowledge. Visitor, in reality nobody can have knowledge, nobody can have anything. Maharaj, in reality nobody can avoid knowledge. Nobody means who? Visitor, this is the proprietor. Maharaj, nobody means the one who could refer to whom. Visitor, this is the proprietor whom you cannot know. Even the proprietor goes at once. Though I could not be the owner of knowledge for two reasons. First you cannot own any thought. Secondly, the proprietor does not live longer than one or two seconds. He also is a thought. Maharaj, this is all right on the worldly level but truthfully nothing is. At the highest level in reality nothing is. At the worldly level everything is. Visitor, does this mean everything is a form of consciousness? Maharaj, whatever is is an expression of consciousness only. If consciousness is not there the expression of consciousness is not there either. Therefore nothing is. And this consciousness is an uncalled for concept, it has appeared spontaneously. Visitor, so once one has heard the truth, there really is only one obstacle, to think that can one reach it when one actually can't. Maharaj, after one has got the truth, there is only one obstacle. Visitor, it appears that you have to reach it to attain it. Maharaj, when you have heard the truth it still needs to be emulated in order to be reached. Visitor, your attempt to understand it, that is the one obstacle. How? Maharaj, because the truth has no form, no name. So how can it be understood? Visitor, but that is something one continues to try for a long period. Maharaj, in the process of trying to understand, you get purified and the process subsides. So long as the food body essence is available, this consciousness endures. When the consciousness quits the body, that knowingness is no longer there. There remains only the universal consciousness without the knowingness, the non-knowingness state or anything else. Then in that state there is no question of manifest or unmanifest. That comes only with the presence of consciousness. So long as the association with the body essence is there, this kuna, this state of I amness or beingness is available. But once this food essence is gone, that I amness state is also gone. This guna, this consciousness, depends entirely on the food body essence. Once the latter is exhausted or no longer available, this consciousness or this guna is also not there. To repeat the life force, the touch of I amness or this guna, is not there in the absence of the food body essence, whether it concerns an ant or an elephant. All the stories of reincarnation rebirth are mere stories meant for the ignorant masses. Visitor, the past is always projected from this moment. Maharaj, whatever has happened, that is the past. Visitor, but we can never touch the past, we are only now. So we cannot touch anything which is not now. So maybe there is no such thing as the past. Maharaj, what have you to say, visitor, so if there is no past, there is no bondage. Maharaj, but who says that it cannot be touched the past? Visitor, I say so. Maharaj, but who is the one who said I? This means that by the word I, that chitana, that manifest, dynamic principle caught itself in that word I. 
if that dynamic manifest principle does not get caught up in the concept, then it has no birth and no death. Visitor, is it possible when you look for what you are that you identify yourself not with consciousness, but that you misapprehend it? Could it be that when you look for yourself, you take this consciousness Maharaj is talking about for that which you are that you get it mixed up? Second visitor, you mistake consciousness for the ultimate. Maharaj, yes, that consciousness is the prerequisite for anything. Without the consciousness, you cannot even do that search, you cannot look inward. Please proceed with the question. Visitor, that is all. But when you make this mistake, when you identify yourself with consciousness, is it still some kind of feeling or experience? Maharaj, you are consciousness. Where is the question of your merging with the consciousness? Your consciousness means you are. Your ness and consciousness are not separate. The your state itself is the consciousness. Can you follow me? You know you are, without the words you are. That itself is the consciousness. Visitor, can this consciousness exist without forms? Maharaj, this consciousness cannot know itself in the absence of a form of food body essence. Body is a form. For example, you are detecting some bad smell. There must be something from which the bad smell emanates. So something must be present. Likewise, to have this touch of I amness, something must be there. And what is that something? Body food essence. This body must be there, which is food essence. Storage of food essence is the body. After a long pause, I had high expectations in you that you would initiate some interesting talks. If nobody talks, I will close the session and send people home. Visitor, I have done some homework for questions. I had to jot them down because when I sit here all my questions vanish. When I go home the questions come back. You said one must always remember I am. Maharaj, is it necessary that you should remember that you are? Spontaneously you know and remember that you are. That is why you have come here, have you not? Because you are. They put there. Currently, you are not yet that knowledgeable to be able to realize the happiness that goes with that state. You have yet to evolve. Visitor, I don't get it. Maharaj, you are not mature enough yet. And really, when you finally understand, you will realize that all this, whatever you have understood, is not the truth. Visitor, that is what I realize in my mind. Maharaj, what can the mind understand? Can the mind have any wisdom? Whatever passing show it observes, that is the mind. Whatever is read, whatever is heard, that again flows out, that is the mind. Whatever earlier impressions entered when they flow out, the flowing out is the mind. Visitor, in a way I don't want to ask questions because if I put a clever question and I get a clever answer in return, I become more and more clever and it is no use. Maharaj, you ask a clever question and you get a clever reply. Is that what you mean? Visitor, yes. This makes me even more clever and then I start. It is no use therefore I don't want to ask questions. Maharaj, so you don't want to become clever? The state you want is non-cleverness. Is it something like that? Visitor, I may become very clever but it does not help. It does not make me happy. Maharaj, it is of no use. But who observes it? Who is saying this? Who has made all the observations? Visitor, the witness. Maharaj, I would like to know who is that witness and witness of what? Visitor, well, I can say I am the witness, I am not sure. Maharaj, and witness what? Visitor, intelligence, the world, everything, all that is manifested. Maharaj, how long are you going to be at that post of witnessing? How long are you in a witnessing position? It is the knowingness that is the trouble, the source of all troubles. 
In the absence of knowingness of that consciousness where is the question of misery, pain or pleasure? Visitor, nowhere. Maharaj, now you know it, you can go home, you've got it. Visitor, but I don't feel it, I don't experience it like that. I can explain everything most cleverly, but it still does not work, even for myself. Maharaj, so long as beingness I am Ness is there, why worry about utility or no utility? In the absence of consciousness, there is no question of utility or no utility. Visitor, why utility? Maharaj, usefulness or no usefulness? Visitor, does it mean losing the consciousness? Maharaj, did you ever catch hold of consciousness and made it your own your property? Maharaj, then keep quiet. It consciousness has come spontaneously. How is it that everyone has suddenly gone into silence? Visitor, is it not what he wants? Laughter. Second visitor, can we get some advice for not getting things mixed up? Sometimes I take this as I am, other times I take that as I am. Can Maharaj give some advice to ensure we don't mistakenly hold something for I am? Maharaj, don't say I am this, I am that. Just hold on to yourself, you are. Just be. Just be you are. Do you follow? Visitor, yes, but sometimes I imagine that I experience I am. Sometimes, not always. Maharaj, every moment you are experiencing I am. Are you not experiencing yourself right now? You are? Visitor, as a body, yes. Maharaj, you know you are. Aren't you? Visitor, yes, as a body, as a mind, I am. Maharaj, prior to body and prior to mind, are you not there? Visitor, I don't know. Maharaj, are you or are you not? Who recognizes the mind? You recognize the mind. So you are. Visitor, separated. Maharaj, recognizing the mind, you are apart from the mind, aren't you? Visitor, yes. Maharaj, you recognize the body. So you are apart from the body. You exist prior to body, separate from the body and separate from the mind, do you not? Do you understand? Visitor, I understand. Visitor, is that the same as when you meditate and you keep repeating a mantra in your head? Maharaj, suppose you meditate, meditate on the Atman or something, be there. Recede. Whatever you meditate on, you are not that. Whatever you observe, you are not that. So in this way, reject everything whatever you observe, and finally settle down where no more observation is. Visitor, I could meditate only very little through fear arising. Maharaj, you are not the fear. You observe the fear, did you not? You acknowledge it because you accept it. Recede from that. You are not that. Get back. Visitor, but the more I get back, the more fear comes. Maharaj, but still you have to get back. You are the rearmost background principle. Visitor, it is hard to be convinced of that when you are meditating and the fear comes. It is hard to remember. Maharaj, let the fear come. It does not matter if you are overwhelmed by fear and you are dead, whatever that is. Caught in the fear, let it be dead. But you are still in the background. Let the fear appear to you. Visitor, then when it feels to me that I am dying, is that no problem? Maharaj, then let yourself die. That which is caught by the fear will die, but you won't die. You will be really immortal. Visitor, I know I have experienced it many times. Interpreter, you survived, didn't you? So then? Visitor, the trouble is endless. The fear and the trouble are endless. Maharaj, everything will go but you will not go, you will not die. Visitor, I will try again. Maharaj, what are you going to do now? Visitor, meditate. Maharaj, when you say you are going into meditation on what do you meditate? 
Visitor, I will sit and just watch what comes up and then I keep telling myself, that's something, that's something, Meharaj, that is all nothing else. Visitor, and I will come here every day of course. Meharaj, for four or five days. Visitor, what do you mean four or five days? Meharaj, you can come here four or five days. Visitor, not longer? Meharaj, there is no accommodation for newcomers. By all means, in order to thoroughly understand you can come. But then you should go. Visitor, understanding itself is not enough for me. Maharaj, then what else you want? Visitor, become more realized, giggling. Maharaj, realized. Whose realization? Somebody else's or yours? Your self-realization, would it be like this, makes gesture. Visitor, what do you mean by like this? I have not understood the question. Meharaj, listen to my talks thoroughly for four or five days, and then go and imbibe them. Visitor, I am fully aware of the question I am going to put, but it cannot be grasped by the mind or the booty intellect. Somebody is realizing, the unmanifest, but there is nothing to realize, it is there forever. Time and space are not binding upon it. Correct. Maharaj, have you realized that? Is it your experience? Visitor, no. Maharaj, then don't ask me about somebody else. This your ness does not occur to you. You are. Is it time bound or is it beyond time? You now know that you were not. This I am ness was not. It has come afterwards. I am Ness has come at a certain time. You know you are. Prior to that, this your Ness was not. So how can you say this your Ness is beyond time? It is time bound. It has appeared, therefore it must disappear. Visitor, long and unintelligible statement about living the unmanifest state. Maharaj, all this talk is merely verbal acrobaties. I want to know, what is this your medicine? Why are you? What are you? Due to what are you? In the absence of that medicine you are, what are you? Before understanding this your medicine and dismissing it, you are talking about a state without your medicine. Understand what it is. My state is, I am without parents. I am the unborn. Similarly, I understand you as such only. You are also the unborn without parents. I have been telling you again and again, that you exist is due to that you are medicine. It has a certain period of time. Again and again, I have been telling you that, and still you are putting the same basic question. Someone asked me a queer question. I am responsible for the birth of fifty children. Due to what are they born? That was his question. Suppose your father asks such a silly question of somebody else. All this talking about the manifest and unmanifest is mere talk for the sake of entertainment. First find out what is this medicine. You are? Due to what? When you recognize and transcend that, you are a Mahatma and people will come and talk to you. Have you understood this principle I am? When spiritually experienced people come here, they enter into a dialogue just for entertainment. In the true state nothing is. All this spiritual talk is spiritual jargon. You can talk in the world to the ignorant masses. You can convey any number of concepts to them. Let me give you an example. In certain parts of our country, when a person is dead, his ornaments are given to a barber because from the barber they will go to the dead person. That is the concept. And such concepts are all for the ignorant people. But you can't very well tell such stories here when discussing profound spiritual matters. Ultimately, what are these spiritual talks? They are meant for so long as ignorance prevails. To remove the ignorance, so-called knowledge is necessary. The knowledge removes the ignorance and then itself also goes, both knowledge and ignorance are thrown overboard. What remains is the absolute. Take for example the questions of rebirth and reincarnation. 
In this manifest play of the five elements, there is no entity as such, no individual or personality. Out of the five elemental play, when the quintessence of that play in the form of the food essence appeared in a certain form, the moment is there, that is the normal ignorant personality. So long as that food essence body is available with that vital breath, the life force is there. That is the birth. When the body is not available, we call it death. Then again, a rebirth. Rebirth of what? Of the five elemental play. There is no birth of a certain personality of this or that fellow. The question does not even arise. Visitor, when the body dies, it means there is no pain after death of the body. Maharaj, what do you mean by death of the body? Does the body die? Can this die? Referring to his cigarette lighter. Visitor, but that is not a living thing. Maharaj, if you make a flame it is full of life and fire. When the vital breath quits the body, this quality of I amness also disappears. That is where the air becomes manifest, it merges with the universal air. This I amness. The consciousness also merges with the universal consciousness. In that state there is no knowingness and the body becomes one with the five elements. Where is the death? When the flame is extinguished, would you call it death? In other words, when this is completely consumed, is it not death? You may call it death also. Chapter 3 A true sage is he who has transcended the personality. Visitor, there are many people who purport to speak about truth but only a few can be truly convincing. Why is that? Maharaj, why do you ask me? How can I tell you? Somebody did not get a child and you are asking me, why did I not get a child? Such questions have no place or relevance here. This philosophy has already been explained to you. Why do you ask such questions? Ask only about your own self. Talk on this matter will be perfectly all right, but I have no energy to talk about random matters. Talk only about the self and I will come straight to the point and explain matters to you. But no other topics. Did you get knowledge from me or somebody else? Visitor, I think mostly from my own self. Meharaj, if that is the case and you are getting knowledge through your own self, you should not have been coming here in the place. Visitor, I did not mean to say all knowledge or the ultimate knowledge. Interpreter, Maharaj wants to know whatever you are getting here. What other masters have expounded knowledge to you? Second visitor, he wants to know what your sources are, what you have read or from whom you have heard anything else. Visitor, I started off with drugs then I listened to Walter Kier and ended up listening to Maharaj. Maharaj, since you said that your knowledge has sprouted in your own self, then don't come back tomorrow. Visitor, yes, but that was only knowledge of changes, not knowledge about the I am or the changeless. Maharaj, if you really did get the knowledge through you, why should I break my head over you? Interpreter, don't ask any irrelevant questions for Maharaj tires easily. Just because he is available to us does not mean we should fling any question at him. Maharaj, I have to suffer for all my talks physically. Visitor, most of us come from Europe where we don't have this guru disciple tradition and so we don't know how to behave. Maharaj, here traditionally the guru is the highest god, the god of the gods. Pause. Maharaj, one who has understood this, that the consciousness which has been restricted to the body is in reality the limitless, universal consciousness, if he has accepted this with conviction, what more does he need? Whatever I say is from the point of view that I am without body-mind, and if you want to accept whatever I say from the point of view that you are body-mind, and expect to get something from it as a similar object, how can it be of use? I repeat, whatever I say is from the conviction that I am without the body that I am no body. Therefore, if someone wants to understand that, but remains himself identified with the body, how can he ever hope to grasp what I am trying to convey? Any questions? 
put them, but understand that we are speaking and asking on the basis that we do not have a body. There is a body and the body is suffering. But I know that I am not the body, I am the universal consciousness. I will not talk about what is being generally talked about elsewhere on the mistaken notion that they are discussing spiritual knowledge. I will only speak about one's own self. I will not fool people because I want them to come here and they come to me as Kiru. What is to be understood is that I, the self comprises all things, this unity is to be understood thoroughly. Can there be anything else but one? There have been any number of avatars. They have gone but their bodies have merged into the five elements. Has anything changed? The self continues to be what it was for millions of years. Understand this as the pure mind and anything else is tomfoolery. Consciousness within the body gets itself entangled in the various concepts which it has been given and which it has acquired and now considers as part of itself. In what I am saying now, I give a picture of what you think yourselves to be. The Johnny knows that this is totally untrue and he knows the truth. Visitor thought can never understand this. It takes a while before thoughts are completely exhausted and stop trying to understand. The understanding sinks in the moment the seeker disappears. Maharaj, only when one is convinced about this totally, there is nothing further that anyone can tell you and nothing further to be understood. Where is even the question of conviction? The body is going to disappear and mingle with the five elements, the breath will mingle with the air, and the consciousness with the universal consciousness. It is as simple as that. Be without the body first, and then whatever words emerge will be knowledge itself. They will not be coming from a particular apparatus. The words will be knowledge itself. Body is of the nature of food, and if there is an illness, it is an illness on the body because there has been an imbalance in what constitutes the body. How am I concerned? This life force, the breath and consciousness, they are like the sun and sunlight. There is so much unity in that. They are really one. So when one disappears, the other also goes. Start with, if you cannot consider yourself as consciousness, at least consider yourself the life force, because the two are one but in any case not the body. The life force and the consciousness are always free, but because they have associated themselves with the body, the bondage has come about. Once you decide that you are not the body and this conviction grows, your body will be all the healthier for it. Visitor, is that the carrot to make the donkey run? Maharaj, that you will know best yourself. This consciousness that I am, I am the original. I am the landlord, not the tenant. Take any concept that you like, but don't look to me for giving you any further concepts. You may adopt any concept that will make you happy, but remember it is still only a concept. Suppose you are sitting quietly. Suddenly one thought appears and we are very, very unhappy. Then some other thought comes and the original thought and the unhappiness both disappear. So long as one depends on the mind, the mind will always make us unhappy. What is suffering really? Suffering is only something which has been engendered by a thought or a word, the mind. If that does not arise, where is the question of unhappiness? Whatever knowledge I give is always free and open, but the one who receives it, if he does not keep himself open to receptivity, what can I do? On this point, are there any questions? Your speech, that breath of words, that breath of thought, that breath of it with the body, or is it without the body? The speech is without the body, the mind is without the body, the life force is without the body, and whatever happens is through the effect of the life force. The life force signifies movement, consciousness is movement. Only when I interpret what is in the mind do I become happy or unhappy. So long as the mind does not work and there is no interpretation, there is no question of being happy or unhappy. Whatever you consider as happiness or unhappiness, sin or merit, heaven or hell, all those depend entirely on the meaning of the words, and that is the word, that is the thought, and that is the mind. 
I repeat, one who has understood this. I will not have him here, but those who think they have understood and are still in the process of digesting it and come here with great zeal and sincerity, to them I will tell them in brief words what the position is and then send them out too. Unless there is consciousness, how can there be concepts of ether and atmosphere, the sky and space? The consciousness is always the prime factor. And the life force and this consciousness within the body are bound to disappear. The manner in which the subject is being discussed here, is it at all similar to that in which your guru was expounding the subject? Visitor, of course that depends very much on who is there. Sometimes the approach was more like this, other times more like that. Meharaj, why do I talk in such a fashion? This could be misunderstood. I speak the way I like because I know that I am no body and no thing. Therefore I come and feel obliged to speak. I am and I am not, and I am neither. Neither the presence nor the absence, that is why I say whatever comes up. Anyone who is conscious of his presence will not talk in such open fashion. I have perceived what is and I also have perceived what is not. And when both what is and what is not have disappeared, then what remains is I. I am certainly not presence and not even the presence of the absence. All knowledge anyone, however great, can have is that knowledge which one has at that split second when he is not asleep and not even awake. He cannot say what sleep was, for in sleep he is not consciously present. All he can say is something when he is awake, when the consciousness is there. Take the case of a jhani, he does have jhana. But is he able to say from where his knowledge has arisen? Knowledge has arisen from a point where there was no knowledge. How did it arise? What is its nature? Those who have come here and have had knowledge, how will they be able to convey it to others? What really happens in the world is, somebody gathers a lot of material, somebody's judgment and somebody else's judgment. A number of judgments are collected, and the whole combination he considers the capital of his knowledge. And it is only that which he can distribute. They merely exchange views. Shankara said this and Buddha said that and somebody else says something else. In this fashion they exchange views and call it jhana. But the one who passes on these opinions of others, when they gave these judgments was he there? Was it the state of affairs when one understood the presence of the other, and both understood each other's presence? If that was the case, then it is different. But merely parroting the opinions of others, that is not knowledge. Things that happened in the past, as well as judgments given in the past, are being exchanged among a group of people who then call that knowledge. That primary concept, which is I love, not only that I exist but I love, that is the basic concept which brings about the assumption of all other concepts by people. For years and years I may not know that I was going to be born. Even the day prior to the conception, I did not know I was going to be conceived. And then after nine months, the body is born and after a few months, when the consciousness is actively working. I realize that I am born. To a particular visitor, I consider you a jani and I want an answer from you. What was born and how was it born? That is, as far as you are concerned. Visitor, only the idea I am. Maharaj, who told you about this? Visitor, my parents. They told me I have a body, a character and so on. Maharaj, that is all. Whatever knowledge you have is hearsay. That is my point. How can somebody who does not have knowledge of his true self be a guru? Only he can be a guru who has knowledge of his true nature. If one knew that he was going to be born, he would refuse. He would not have accepted the proposition that he should go in the food. Thank you, I'll pass, I don't want it. Maharaj, in that state which prevails after the dropping of the body, is there any memory? Conventionally or traditionally, people say there is still memory even after the body goes. I do not believe that because there is no experience of it. So long as the body is there, the mind is there, 
and the mind creates an individually made memory pattern. Therefore, the individuality is there. When you are the manifest state with the consciousness, there is no play of mind and therefore no individuality. You are the manifest only. So if at all thoughts occur, they will not be related to the individualistic idea that manifests about nature only. What about the sages who are dead and gone? Whatever state they had prior to assuming a body, they have reverted to that original state. This knowingness, consciousness, I am Ness comes only with the body that is given. When a Jani does not have a body, he does not need anything, he is consciousness. Interpreter, in your country also there might be sages. So I said to Maharaj, the way we accept sages here with great reverence and awe is probably not customary there. There may be others I don't really know. They have probably heard about sages like Ramana Maharshi because through Maharshi they came to know about the possibility of self-realization. Maharaj, a sage is one who has transcended individuality, personality and abides in the manifest consciousness. So the yardstick is his abidance in consciousness. That manifest consciousness expresses itself through a particular body that is the sage. But that body has no individuality. Such entities only are true sages being the background of manifest consciousness. Visitor, before coming to India I had tried everywhere to get answers to my questions but nobody would give them. I tried everyone, Catholics, Protestants, but no one could answer my fundamental questions. Maharaj, why did they not answer? Visitor, they did not know. For example, everybody was talking about the soul. So I said, what is this soul? Nobody knew. All these people were using the word without explaining what it means. Soul is not Atma. Atma is impersonal. Soul is a kind of spiritual personality. The soul is a mixture of Atma and Jiva. Maharaj, do you understand what is the Atma? Visitor, that which remains when thought vanishes. Maharaj, and when the thought is there, what is it? Visitor, when we are still. Maharaj, the Atma conditioned consciousness conditioned by thought. Visitor, the Atma is that which never changes which all thoughts, fears and sense perceptions have in common. Interpreter, you said when thoughts are not there. But when the thoughts are there, visitor, Atma is also there. It is that which all thoughts and feelings have in common. It is something which is present in every thought, every feeling, and every sense perception which does not change. Maharaj, whatever you are, that consciousness, the knowingness that itself is the Atma. When you understand that consciousness with the identity of the body, you suffer. A guru feels exhilarated when he sees that the disciple has become mature in spirituality, is growing from the inside. We must talk when it is indicative of that maturing only. I expect questions from you at your proper level, don't send questions at lower levels. Visitor, at my level, I am only interested in silence. Maharaj, your talk is of such a high caliber or at such a high level that it is not intelligible to the common man of any religion. A Christian worships Jesus Christ, a Muslim believes in the prophet or a god, Hindus worship so many gods, but you do not do any of this. You do not discuss any of the rituals of worshipping or doing this and that. You don't believe in all this so your talking is really useless. Whatever you are, that you are, the consciousness, the Atman, or the Self in you, that itself is nothing other than God. All the names and titles of other gods are meant for you only. You are the knowledge I am. So if you want to worship, worship that knowledge I am. Be devoted to that I amness only. When you do that, all other rituals become redundant, useless. Finally, when you realize that everything is useless, Everything is Brahman. It means you are at the Parabrahman level, the absolute level. When at that level, you will envision everything is useless, including the Brahman because the Brahman is also reduced to illusion. 
Therefore, all these talks, including my own, will be reduced to illusion when you reach the highest. Visitor, then all this worshipping will be put to rest? Maharaj, if a human being has the inclination towards devotion, it gives rise to a certain mood, feelings of adoration and worship. However, the godly state, the consciousness or beingness, transcends even this emotional state. How to transcend such an emotional state? For this purpose, certain practices are recommended. Emotions should be sublimated. You cannot expel or suppress them, for the emotional side of us is part and parcel of human nature, certainly at the lower stages. Visitor asks about a book by Ramdas. Interpreter, his, the visitor's, guru has told him that before reading the book, which will take, say, from two weeks to a month, he should worship it. You must give a prasad for that book. Do you know the meaning of prasad? Something to eat. Maharaj, is that book going to eat? When you worship it, do you think that book is getting pleased? It is only to satisfy or sublimate your own emotion. Good or bad, it is all an expression of your emotions. Visitor, I want to know my Atman. How should I proceed? Maharaj, you are that itself is the Atman. Atman is not to know anything. That very knowledge is the Atman. Worship Atman as the God, there is nothing else. You worship that principle only, nothing else needs to be done. This very knowledge you are will lead to the highest, to the ultimate. This you are is there so long as the vital breath is present. And when you worship that you are as the manifest Brahman only, you reach immortality. Suppose you pass on in common parlance, death occurs to you, then that your knowledge will be the manifest knowledge only and you will not die. Visitor asks a question in Marathi, untranslated. Maharaj, who are you? You know you are sitting here, you know you are without words, just be that you are only. I don't like to use flowery, redundant language to put all this into words. I will come straight to the point. How many sages are going to talk from the standpoint of the self only? There is the only Atman. He is the space Atman, the fire Atman, the water Atman, they are all the same for the five elements. The one who has the firm conviction that except for the I am Ness there is no other self, he stabilizes in the Parabrahman. Maharaj, the one who abides in that principle by which he knows I am. He is the manifest. He abides in that manifest Brahman all the twenty-four hours. Whether the body remains or not that manifest self-principle always prevails. In that form comes the knowledge I am. The knowledge I am. With a consciousness with the self, the human particle is significant. Who are they who have propounded the worship of deities and finally the self? Only those personalities, those sages, who understood and transcended the very source of this manifest world, this beingness, this touch of I amness, advocated to the masses the worship of the gods, ultimately leading to the beingness. You must continually remember, chew the cud, that the knowledge I am signifies knowing all the gods, all the Vedas, it is the Brahman only. You must continually think about it. And should in the course of such reminiscing, the body drop off, then that consciousness will definitely be the highest. Chapter 4 If you want the happiness of self, get rid of the body-mind sense. Visitor, we spend our lives always searching after happiness. Maharaj, could you define what is happiness? You won't be able to. Do you want the happiness of having a wife, the happiness of eating food? Visitor, I want the happiness of self. Maharaj, if you want the happiness of self, get rid of the body-mind sense. There are plenty of things to talk about and I can. But don't talk about anything irrelevant. Think about that self with the touch of I amness only. Make that the very core of your being, and you will understand that itself is the manifest Brahman. Interpreter, if you have read the book I Am That and wish to make any comments, you may do so now. Maharaj, I would like to know what is the knowledge you have of your own self that you are. 
You are here right now. What is it that you are? To know that you are is that knowledge, you are without words. Visitor, sometimes there is a mood of happiness which I cannot explain. At that moment nothing can be explained. Now that I am sitting here I can say, it happens like this, but that again is a bodily experience. Maharaj, I call it, unintelligible Marathi or Sanskrit expression, the prior most I principle. Prior to anything. Subsequent to that, the five elements come out of that, conjuring up the space and the remaining four elements. So there in that prior most principle, we have to stabilize. Question now is, is one stabilizing downward or upward? Common parlance has it that I am getting elevated, my position is getting higher and higher. But it is not so. We have to subside, settle down into our original state and our priormost state. So I prefer to call it the lower state, to subside into one's foundation, sink into the source. From your standpoint, what is knowledge? Knowledge is that which is collected by the words or their meaning, which means the mind. But that is not the self-knowledge. Self-knowledge cannot be captured by words or the mind. You are sitting here. You are. Prior to words. Now the hearsay goes I am. I am means the flow of mind has started. Now whatever you say with that I am nest through the mind about you, you have represented as yourself. But that is not so. The traditional knowledge comprises whatever is collected through this mind or through the words externally. But that is not the self-knowledge which is prior to that also. How could there be any bondage or shackles to the Atman? It alas only the meaning of the words which one accepts for oneself that becomes the shackles. We want only that self-knowledge which is acceptable or palatable to the mind, not true knowledge. But that which is accepted by the mind is only a yoke. The Atman principle remains untouched by the meaning of the words that flow from it. Even the four aspects of the language para, pashyanti, madhyama, and vaikari do not touch it. Words trying to describe that original, primordial state invariably fail. That is why the mind sinks into quietude and why the Vedas settle into quietude. And when there are no words to use, it means there are no Vedas. Even in the worldly, everyday life you must develop the conviction that whatever language sprouts out of you is the language of the Vedas only. Visitor, this means that you must have that purity in you. Maharaj, we must be purified to that extent. In order for the Veda language to come out of us, it is not a question of being purified or not purified. One has to understand the principle. Whatever I say, you must aperceive directly without the filter of the words. Because if we accept the words, what happens? Based on those words, we create a concept, and then based on that concept, we accept that for what we are. We create an image based on a certain concept based on the words we think we are hearing. But that is not jhana. Only that which is directly aperceived is knowledge. The capital we have is this knowledge I am. But what have we done? We have handed over that knowledge to the body and we say I am the body. Thereby we have reduced the totality, the limitless, to the limited, a specified, insignificant body. And that is why being unable to give up this association with the body, we are afraid of dying. If any idea is traumatic, it is the idea of death. Why? because we are not able to disassociate ourselves from this identity with the body. The knowledge I try to convey will not be acceptable to the average person, even if he happens to be interested in spiritual knowledge. This is because he expects something from the point of view of the body, this identification with the body. In that state as an object he wants to get something knowledge as an object which is impossible because knowledge is purely subjective. Note, Maharaj obviously does not use this term in the usual sense of a matter of opinion. He is referring to the knowledge that lies beyond the subject-object relationship, when the subject is knowing himself as subject and not as object. 
How amusing it is that all of you are listening to what I am saying, but do not accept what the words are trying to express regarding your identity. You listen but the real meaning underlying the words is not accepted. There is no receptivity for what is being conveyed. It is only a rare one who directly perceives what I am trying to say without the words one in ten million. You all entertain a certain concept, and whatever I say you are trying to have within the limits of that concept. Then you say yes, that is acceptable to me. You listen to me once, twice or several times. Then at the end of a certain period you come to the conclusion, I have not benefited much from Maharad's words. Why? Because based on the words you are trying to create an image about yourselves. And when whatever I say appeals to you according to that concept, you say yes now I have got the knowledge and now I understand what Maharaj is saying and Maharaj is right. Why? Because what I say appeals to your concept. I would like to know from all of you whether what I say appeals to you as truth and is beneficial. I repeat, when does one say that it is beneficial? When it tallies with the concept one cherishes. Then you say yes, it is beneficial. And when it does not tally, you say sorry, that does not appeal to me, it is not for me. We stick to the words and the meaning, forgetting that what we are is prior to even the beginning of not only the word but also the first basic thought. Visitor, then there is no communication, no grasp of what is being said. Meharaj, I started saying that that which you are is prior to any words or thoughts. So that cannot be identified as such. You can have a word and meaning for almost anything, but for this being there is no author, no word. Any other thing has been or can be acquired, but with respect to this there is no acquisition, you are that. Many of these jappy tappies, even those who consider themselves as Johnnies, are still entangled in the concept based on certain words. Any mind or word created design can have no real significance to you, for it is only conceptual, your true nature is such that it can have no color or design. Visitor, I have read the questions and answers from I am that. I found it hard to understand how Maharaj, though in the body, always answers questions from the highest level only, and somehow it has filled me with the greatest happiness. It may be bodily happiness also. I do not want to say anything about that. But both of us, my son and myself, have had supreme moments of joy, peak experiences, if you like, during the reading of some of the answers. Maharaj, because I am stabilized in that foremost absolute principle, all the talk will emanate from that level only. Whenever you talk from the five elemental bodily or consciousness state that will pertain to the worldly life. But this is purely the knowledge related to the highest. Chapter 5. Don't be identified with a corpse and be happy. Visitor, sitting in Maharad's presence, I had a certain bodily experience. How should I understand this? Maharaj, in trying to understand the experience, whatever significance your words and concepts give to it will be acceptable to you. But that is not the knowledge. That is why I am not very keen to ask people to stay for any extended period of time, because if you do stay that long, you will not be able to understand. In the course of your initial eight or ten days, Whatever is somewhat understood will first have to be properly digested. Until then any further talks will not be absorbed. Assuming that a person is knowledgeable, then what will happen is this. Having left this place, he will not be able to remain alone for long. He craves company to whom he can deliver the goods of spirituality. He likes to seek out somebody with whom he can talk and discuss spirituality. Otherwise, he feels very unhappy. You feel happy and satisfied if you don't encounter other sadhakas. The question was asked by the translator, whether it is not necessary for a serious seeker to go through the stage where one likes to dole out whatever knowledge one has, to share it with others. My answer was that this is a part of the process, but that it also must come to an end, 
this desire to discuss and exchange views on spirituality. That highest state is the unborn state, in which there is no experience. According to the translator, Maharaj is not feeling well today, he is very weak almost in a daze. Before this sickness or my present condition I was there. This sickness has come as a temporary phase, but I am prior to that. People normally feel when sickness comes that they are going to die. But I am not going to die. There is no death to me, but it is the sickness that will accept it. If a sick person will remember this principle only, that prior to the sickness he was in his true nature as ever prior to the sickness, if he truly realizes this, then the impact of the sickness will be less. On the other hand, when so-called knowledgeable people are sick, they accelerate their death by imagining that they are going to die. What do you understand by the word dream? How do you understand a dream? Is not the dream something like a drama, a play? In the light of the consciousness, all kinds of play take place. The dream is one of these, and in the end it again merges into the consciousness. To one who realizes that this consciousness is an indication of his presence, that it is in fact conscious presence, when I am conscious, it means that I am present, all bewilderment ceases. Thus within that presence as such, there is no individual present who sees something, that is, there is neither the seer nor the seen in the impersonal presence. Again, I repeat that impersonal presence is merely an indication of presence as such, not of any individual. It is an assurance, a guarantee of one's presence. If I have consciousness, it means I am certain that I am present. To one who really understands what has been said here, a dream is no different from what is seen in the waking state. Both are plays in the consciousness. Because of the light of the consciousness, we call one thing the waking state, another thing the dream, but in essence both are events happening in the consciousness and essentially they are not different. In this impersonal presence as such, the only thing present is the light of consciousness, without any form or shape. Whatever is seen is seen in that light. Many people are under the impression that they are acting in the play, but this is a mistaken notion. All that happens is that the light of the consciousness shows various things happening. Visitor, the actor is part of the play. Maharaj, why does something appear to us as actual or real? Because something that one sees every day or often conveys a sense of reality or actuality. Therefore we accept it as more actual, more real than something that appears in a dream, but essentially they are the same. How is a jani? The jani is like the cigarette lighter without the flame. When the lighter is lit, the consciousness comes in. And whatever happens is seen in the light of that consciousness. But whether or not there is the light of the consciousness, the jani is ever there. In deep sleep we are like the condition of the unlit lighter. There is no light, therefore nothing happens. But even in that state, the light may come on. From the moment that slight consciousness arises, the dream occurs and one appears to act in that dream as part of the dream. I repeat, I am not talking about what happens to an individual. I am only talking about the total manifestation and how that manifestation arises. Because of the impersonal consciousness, there is the impersonal presence. But a difficulty arises because while the composite consisting of body, vital breath and consciousness has no shape or form, we identify all three with the body, and so we become unhappy. But once we realize the basis of it, that the total manifestation is only in the impersonal consciousness which is presence, impersonal presence, there is no longer any difficulty. On the other hand, so long as this charge of having a male or female body is not removed from that which exists impersonally, the trouble will continue and unhappiness will persist. This composite of body, vital breath and knowingness does not know itself as I am in the absence of that knowledge I am. The vital force is also our self, without form. 
Similarly, the knowingness has no form. Now this vital force depends on the food essence body to sustain itself, and on the manas that is the mind, it also feeds on the mind. This vital force is the agent for all activities. And this knowledge, I am is a mere witness, yet this entire composite must be available. To repeat, that vital force does not know itself, it does not go into activity in the absence of the knowledge I am. And that knowledge is available only if a sustaining body is available. Now so long as you do not remove the charge that this vital force and the knowledge I am is male or female, on account of bodily association, you are bound to suffer. Maybe the examples I have given are somewhat pedestrian, but my intention was only to create a stronger impact. How would a Johnny feel when he gives up his body? What type of pleasure or bliss does he experience? Imagine a newly wed couple. The pleasure which they derive from their wedding night is as nothing compared to the highest bliss a jani gets when he quits his body or his life force. I call it the highest bliss in the best festival on the highest day. Compared with the love play of the wedding night, whatever pleasure the couple realize in coming together, the happiness a jani derives in getting separated from the vital breath and the knowingness is thousands of times superior. If the couple are coming together he is coming apart. Take the example of this cigarette lighter. The latter is something like Nirga Narajas that is the heat state. My original true state is Nirga Narajas. Now on the lighter and because of the lighter that flame appears. In the flame, the knowledge I am is there, the mind is there and the vital force is there. The vital force carries out all the activities. The mind communicates, and the knowledge I am is merely a witness, this is the actual state of affairs. For the emanation of any talk the flame must be available. That is, the I amness, the vital breath and the mind must be present, then only the talk can come out. My state is Nirgan Arajas, I am like that lighter only, the flame may be there or it may not. I am Nirguna and Nirajas, I have no attributes, in my state that beingness is absent. Similarly, I don't require any Rajas, that means I don't want any entertainment activities. In my true state, nothing is. When the knowingness or I amness state is there, and the vital breath and mind are also present, this being the Rajas state as compared to the Narajas state of the lighter, some occupation or entertainment is essential. This can be observed in all of us. We can never stay idle. We are always occupied with one thing or another. When the vital breath quits the body, the I amness also goes, what remains is only the Narajas Nirguna state. Former I call the flame state, that is, the I amness. Earlier I said it is the Saganabraman state. That is, the body is there, the vital breath is there, the mind is there, and that knowingness or I amness is there. All that is being entertained by Maya. The state in the absence of this beingness or the Maya is that Nirguna Niraja state, Maya Tita prior to Maya, the absolute state. A hundred years back, what were you? At that time, you did not have the knowledge you are. The memory that you are was missing. Presently, in the temporary phase, you have the knowledge you are. But to have this knowledge, what are the prerequisites? The essence is required, Savaguna. This means the quintessence of the food essence is necessary to sustain the I amness or this beingness. And that essence in turn depends on the food body. But all these together, that is, food body quintessence, and the knowledge I am, the vital breath and the mind, these are all a temporary phase only. So long as food essence is available, the knowingness will last. Now how to escape from all this? This knowingness is to discover itself, it should realize itself. Then, in the process of its realization, it is able to quit the state and abide in the absolute, in the non-knowingness state. So one must abide in oneself first, in the knowingness state. 
Whenever you sit for meditation, you hold on to the form concept that you are a male or a female. Give up these concepts. To do such meditation is almost impossible. Only a rare one will do it without that identification with the body-mind. Visitor, I get a glimpse of your state as to what you are intellectually that is. But in my daily life I am so much under stress. My wife thinks this way, somebody else thinks that way. I am always under tension. So how to get rid of this? Maharaj, I am telling you a simple thing. Get rid of the notion that you are this corpse. The body is dead always, the body is inert. It is alive only by means of your I amness. You are not the body. Hold on to this concept very firmly, and then whatever happens, it is not yours. Somebody is itching to ask questions. Laughter. Visitor, there is quite a big gap between that state and my present state. There is a considerable time gap. I have to do sadhana, purify myself and all that. How can I manage to do all these religious and worldly duties in my busy life? Maharaj, you have recourse to naturopathy. With that not only will you do good to yourself but also to the society. Do all the social work and you will enjoy lots of merit. As to me, I am fed up with this entire waking state and sleep state. Without these two states, I was in the perfect, peaceful state. Did you ever hear the word sorrow and misery in the absence of the deep sleep and waking states? The knowledge I am is the product of interaction within the five elemental state. You are not that. You as the absolute are not the knowledge I am. Visitor, most of us are not satisfied, we are fed up with life. There is some urge but it is not sufficiently strong to withdraw from this daily grind. Maharaj, how can you dispose of this problem? You resent that you are the body, that you are the mind, you are this Satvaguna. I am not the body, that standpoint you must have. It is very simple. The body and in the body, it is like a coin. On one side, you have the vital breath for making possible all activity and on the other side is the knowledge I am. Only when the vital breath is there, the knowledge I am is present. When the vital breath leaves the body, the knowledge I am also disappears. And both of these are the product of the food essence body. I am not that. This entire composite I am not. This you have to realize. Who are your ancestors? They are the food particles, that food essence. Those food essences are your real ancestors. On the earth there is vegetative growth. I call it Vanaspati. The quintessence of that Vanaspati is the food essence, out of that grows Vakaspati. The latter means, insects, worms, bees, mammals, etc., all types of creatures. They survive on this essence of Vanaspati. Now in that Vanaspati juice, that quintessential vegetation juice, there is also a particle, the granule, which contains the sattva guna, the rajas guna and tamas guna. The particle quintessence contains all three qualities. The sattva guna is mere witness, beingness, a touch of I amness. Rajas guna is activity, this guna leads you to activity. And tamas guna represents the claiming of authorship, taking the credit for the activities. Unlike what one can read in the scriptures, your ancestors are in these grains of wheat and rice, and the essence of those are our ancestors. Therein the real essence of our creation is contained. Chapter 6 The Experience of Nothingness Visitor, there arise a feeling of sadness when one hears from Maharaj that I will have to return again and again so long as I have not attained that state of joy of realization. Maharaj, it is just like that flame, you can quit this cycle of travail when you understand that you are not that flame. You are not this composite. So long as you entertain the notion of being a name and a form, you are bound to be enmeshed in your own concepts. Visitor, why does the flame appear? Maharaj, that is its very nature. Visitor, 
If my nature is in the lighter, why does a flame appear? Maharaj, this is not a relevant question. Why does the rain fall? Why should the sun shine? There is no cause for the world experience. For your own experience there is no cause, but you presume that parents are the cause of your existence. Because you respect your parents, you accept they are the cause of your existence. Otherwise, you spontaneously came into existence. Visitor, all the knowledge that science and technology have given us is because of inquiring. Why does it rain? Why does that move the whys and wherefores of everything? Does Maharaj want us to quit all this science and technology and dwell in our inner being through withdrawal? That is a way, but how to balance things? After all, we have to live and work. Maharaj, science may eventually combine different kinds of juices and create a human being, but it is not going to contribute to the general well-being and peace. These will go to pieces. There is only one solution, that is to find out why you are. What is the cause of your being of I am? Actually, you had no knowledge that you are or you were. But at this moment you know you are. Why is that? Understand its cause. You alone know why you are, why it is offered to you that you are, you alone know. Don't ask anyone else about it but inquire by yourself. Don't bother about others, worry only about your own self. That knowledge I am is the product of what is due to what. How and why? Inquire only into this matter. Nine months ago the child was not there. Now just three days back the child was born. And he is crying. What is the child's crying? What is this child? How does he happen to be? The child is crying due to what, the product of what? The world is manifest and expansive. Don't get lost there. Just inquire as to why you are how you are how you happen to be. You were not there earlier. At present you are, how has this confluence taken place from the you are not state? Visitor, there are so many different councils. Go and visit different countries, do this, do that, do social work, get acquainted with different people, etc. Also there is withdrawal, having read the scriptures. Ramana Maharshi, Krishnamurti and others. So the mind is doubting. For this withdrawal, one needs the help of a guru. Is this guru predestined as it says in the Vedas? You know I have seen different gurus. I have been to Krishnamurti Maharaj Ramana Maharshi and have read various books and different teachings. Rajneesh seems to give a modern way, science and technology also. Maharaj gives one dimension only. He says withdraw, be desireless and be active. How to decide who is the best guru? Laughter. Maharaj, I am telling you a simple thing. Accept one statement from any guru. Assimilate that fully and believe in yourself. Consider and accept your own self as the guru. Accept no one else as such. The final prerequisite for this spiritual precept is self-confidence, a firm faith in oneself. If you have no faith in your own self, you are hopeless. You are an outcast. Yourself itself is the Guru. Do you understand now? The Guru is Brahman. The Guru is knowledge. The Guru is Brihaspati and the sum total of all that is your own self. Visitor, I want to ask about God's grace and free will. Meharaj, the bare fact that you are alive, you are that itself is the grace of God. And all the activities that happen through you are the expression of the grace. In such situations, if something bad happens, remember that you are merely because of the grace of God. If the grace of God were not there, that your ness would not be there. So remember that you are itself is the grace of God. Visitor, unintelligible question about doing japa reciting a name of God. Maharaj, the whole significance of doing japa dwells in your faith. You must have faith first. Your self-identity is nourished by such faith through japa. 
Don't do anything mechanically, for then there is no soul in the recitation of the japa. If you don't recite soulfully, there is no point in it at all. Do plenty of dhyana yoga meditation. Practice meditation more and more. Maharaj, I would like to make room for newcomers. Eight days for them only, that should be sufficient for everyone. Some people I will request to stay, I can't explain why. And some people, although they would like to stay, I will send away. There are various kinds of seekers. Some come exclusively for knowledge. They are not interested in the person who delivers it. Once they get the knowledge, they go. Other people want knowledge, but for them the priority is guru worship. Devotion to the guru comes first and only incidentally they collect knowledge. There are some great sages who in their seeker stage used to do devotion or worship of a god only for namesake, but because of their intensity of devotion reach their goal. The one who is doing devotion to his guru to such a person even the god is devoted. Interpreter, because of Maharaj's sickness, many types of experts have come here to offer their advice. So today one person told him that he knew of a healer who could diagnose an illness by feeling the ten fingers and ten toes and could then suggest some treatment. So he approached Maharaj whether he would be interested to have such a person come to see him. But Maharaj said he was not interested and continued to state, I am not the least interested in this daily ritual of getting up in the morning, eating and again sleeping and all this. I have had enough of all that. I do not expect anything from this world. I am not going to achieve, attain, possess anything, because I am fed up with that very consciousness out of which the world is created and want to get rid of this consciousness. Maharaj, people are visiting this place. I treat them with respect and reply to all their questions. But this does not mean that I expect them to come daily. Although they come here, it does not mean that I am seeking their association. I would like to be alone. Whatever natural experiences you encounter, just accept them as they come, just be with them. Don't try to alter anything. Whatever is today it never was, and whatever is today will never be in future. Knowing this entire game of consciousness or maya, the great sage Jain Angwar made his valedictory prayer before taking samadhi. He prayed to God and said, Let the desires of all be fulfilled. Any kind of desire. And then, let the bad people be punished and let good intentions develop in the hearts of people. In spite of that prayer, there was no change in the sum total of those bad things and good things. Finally, all this play, the sum total of all these bad things and good things, is illusion only and there is nobody responsible for the creation. It has spontaneously come about, and ultimately it is an illusion. So there is no question of rectifying or preventing that. It will go on in its own way. There have been so many sages, jappy tappy seekers practicing japas and tapas austerities, spiritual seekers of various orders, they have come and gone but I raise no objection to whatever they say or the way they behave. I have no comments on them. I have come to the conclusion that the world is spontaneously there without any seed and cause. Its creation is seedless, but in the world it is full of seeds for me. Procreation or recreation is going on all the time. Visitor, since Maharaj is a Jani, he must be despising this whole world as something very mean and low. Maharaj, that question does not arise because from my standpoint the world is not. You indicate to me where is the world, what is the world? Can you point your finger and say, this is the world? The world is not, it is a mere appearance. Visitor, having attained knowledge, how is it that you have been able to associate with various kinds of people? Some fellows might be very bad, some people may be obsessed by their minds, some people are good. How could you get on with all such persons? Maharaj, who is to get on? I have no pose, no stance, no fixed form of my own. If I had, it would be difficult to relate to anybody. 
Since I don't have any form by nothingness I have become the subtlest so I can fit into anything, any situation. Suppose a man is rich, he is wearing a lot of ornaments and expensive clothes, when he leaves his house there is always danger lurking. This is on account of the fact that he represents so many ideas, concepts, and because of his reputation that he is somebody, that he is a rich man. He is afraid of going into the street. A naked beggar who goes into the street has nothing to lose. Similarly, having lost everything, I have nothing more to lose. I can encounter any situation and fit into anything. So long as you wear a name and a form, all these problems will be there. In the absence of name and form, there are no problems. Let us say, I have land and property with farms, etc. About the time of the rains, there are always concerns such as whether I will be able to till the soil, whether there are seeds available, etc. All such worries exist. After losing the farms, I am freed from such concerns and all that can be ignored. While sticking to your name and form, you have to worry about things. In the spiritual pursuit, you gradually lose your form and as the form is shed, the name also detaches itself. There are ever so many customers. All are out to gain and possess something in the name of knowledge, even spiritual knowledge, but nobody is a customer for the true self-knowledge. I will tell you about the normal tendency of a person. There is the story about an old man quite well off who had a very satisfying family life, had worldly possessions, and had lived to about a hundred or a hundred twenty-five years. And now he lies on his deathbed in his village house. Normally in the villages even the cattle shed is attached to the main building itself. So you can watch from the bedroom and see the cattle shed. Even on his deathbed, he will not be inclined to thinking very noble thoughts, he will not be contemplating something very high. He is looking at the calf and the calf was chewing a broomstick. He was very worried about the broomstick getting damaged so he was shouting, off with the broomstick while about to kick the bucket. He was calling out, the broomstick, the broomstick. Take care of the broomstick. While uttering that broomstick, broomstick, he breathed his last. The traditional concept is that whatever strong concern one has at the time of death, he will be reincarnated into. So probably he will be born as a broomstick. Maharaj, the question is, what yardstick exists to measure the progress of a seeker? A very weak man was not able to walk. Gradually he started getting stronger and began to walk. So then he knows that he has regained his strength, does he not? The indication of one's progress is shown by your disinclination to associate with so-called normal people. Your desires and expectations get less and less. Please ask some questions, but don't ask anything about family life. Ask only about spiritual knowledge. You must have an intense hunger or need for it to get self-knowledge or spirituality. Complete world picture you get through the five sense organs, and the combination of that multiplied by a certain factor represents your worldly needs. Just like a fish out of water gasps for water, so you must covet self-knowledge. When out of intense hunger for spirituality or self-knowledge the floodgates are opened, you start rejecting everything from the broomstick to Ashvara, up to your own consciousness. You shed everything. In the worldly life with the power of money, you can purchase anything. Similarly, by donating the self, you get the Brahman state. And when you donate the Brahman state, you get the Parabrahman state. In the first state you become the manifest consciousness, in the second or the last state you surrender the consciousness also. At the end of the process, you are the Parabrahman. Visitor, I know the experience of the nothingness, and I just wanted to know where do I go from here. Maharaj, in that nothingness what is present? That you which has been present in that nothingness and has had the experience of nothingness, who or what is that? Someone or something has had the experience of nothingness. Now, what is that someone or something? 
Visitor. Complete emptiness. Maharaj, what is that experience itself? Does it have a shape or form? Visitor, I can't think of any shape or form for it. Maharaj, that which has no shape or form, is that you? Visitor, I don't know. I have only had this experience and I feel every thought and everything else was just a lot of rubbish. Everything in the world is just a lot of nonsense, it has no meaning. The only thing I have got is nothing. That is the only thing that has meaning. I can't express it. Maharaj, that is all right. But in the balance of all this experience and no experience, what is it that you think you are? What is your knowledge about your own identity? What result have you got? What is the balance sheet? Ultimately, what is the conclusion you have arrived at about yourself? Is there something at all, or are you also nothing? Visitor, I am nothing. Maharaj, don't use the word I. But what is it that is nothing? Visitor, I don't know. Maharaj, have you done any meditation? Visitor, there was a seminar of ESD, a four-day course of continual meditation. I went to one of those, and that's where I got the experience of nothingness. Maharaj, what does ESD stand for? Visitor, ASD is an organization, it means to be in French. It is a regular institution that gives seminars. Maharaj, the answer you have given is correct. But with that answer, there is nothing further that can be said. Have you come to that conclusion with conviction? Visitor, yes I have. You see, I have felt that this nothingness, if it indeed is the ultimate reality, that I have been looking for then I am not happy with it because it does not seem to nurture me. Maharaj, if there is nothingness then there is nothingness about nothing left of an individual either. So who is it who is grumbling, who is not satisfied with the experience, with the nothingness? If there is nothingness, there must be total nothingness. There can't be an individual who is away from it and can still say, there is nothingness. So what is this individual, who is not satisfied with the total nothingness which it is? Who is dissatisfied? Who is grumbling? In that nothingness the individual also must be dissolved. Then who is it that is grumbling? Who is it that is not satisfied? Visitor, oh grumbling means, there is no interest now in doing anything or fighting the battles of life as we used to do before like warriors. Interpreter, so that individual has been dissolved? Visitor, there is nothing, absolutely nothing. Interpreter, then where is the dissatisfaction? Dissatisfaction must be felt by somebody. Visitor, how can one live in this world? Interpreter, but who? That is Maharad's question. Visitor, the physical body, the physical manifestation. How can it live and how can it survive on this earth with a form if all the time it has got this concept of complete nothingness? Maharaj, I come back to the same thing. What is it that has to do anything in this nothingness? What is it that is left in this nothingness who has to do anything? Visitor, perhaps this nothingness was only a beginning and was just a quest like everything else. Maharaj, something has turned into nothingness. What is that something that has turned into nothingness? This consciousness that I am, that I exist, that concept itself has turned into nothingness. So what is left? Who is left? Visitor, nothing is left. Maharaj, the answer is a hundred percent correct. But I wanted to find out how steady you are in that nothingness. What is or is not, don't argue about that. We can only talk about what has happened to you. And you as an individual or the conscious presence has been dissolved into nothingness. That is all you can say. Once you are in that situation, there is nothing. Whatever work you do, whatever your behavior is the work and behavior of that child of a barren woman that does not exist as an individual. Visitor, no. I feel as if I am an observer to this whole thing. 
It is all a massive play you know and act. Maharaj, if the one who observes that is also dissolving into nothingness then what? Visitor, but he can't because the physical body is there. Maharaj, the answer was a hundred percent correct. Therefore, I assume that that to which this answer has been has also been dissolved into nothingness, and that there is no individuality left. But from your subsequent treatment of this problem I conclude that this individuality still remains. Therefore, my final answer to you is that you continue to do your sadhana. The jhani who has this experience of nothingness, his individuality does not remain. So whatever happens, he no longer has an instrument with which to undergo any experience. But in your case, you say that nothingness is there, and also your individuality, the two are incompatible that is, mutually exclusive. Therefore continue to do your sadhana. If you really are at a stage where you find the nothingness, what then is left to do anything in this world? Visitor, there is nothing left. But then what should I do commit suicide? Meharaj, you are not there even to die. Visitor, no. I appreciate that. That is not the answer either. Nothing is an answer to this. But where do I go from here? Meharaj, the lady was explaining that there are all kinds of EST type of methods and systems which come with the promise of liberation in 10 or 12 days. As for myself, I no longer care about all this. I have come to this nothingness in which the search has ended because the seeker has also disappeared into that nothingness of which we are talking. I no longer take any interest in that research. First, I have seduced Maya and once the Maya surrendered to me. I had no other use for Maya so I threw her out. Thousands of organizations have come and gone, thousands are yet to come. All of them are based on a certain concept. For example, one had the concept of untouchability. Now to a certain extent that concept of untouchability has gone. But have the people because of that concept been able to realize their true nature? Therefore, none of these organizations have any use. The ultimate thing is to find out about one's true nature. In this, organizations can do nothing because they are all based on a certain concept. Visitor, but this organization put me in touch with my beingness and that is the whole point. Maharaj, in that very nothingness which we have been discussing, the individuality should have been dissolved so that there is no longer anyone who is satisfied or dissatisfied. How could he be satisfied? Because there is no longer anything to be satisfied in, in that nothingness. So what you have got is not the real thing, although your answer was a hundred percent correct. Only that individual who has lost his individuality has merged with the Parabrahman. So the individuality must go. The entire world moves on the basis of one concept, and that is I am, the fundamental concept of one's individuality. Visitor, when the basic concept is I am nothing, how can the world move? That is what I am trying to express. Meharaj, if you had come to the conclusion that you are not, then how can any further concept or any further question arise? If you had really come to the firm conclusion that is no longer there, how can any further question arise at all? Visitor, that means there is nothing further than that. Maharaj, everything that is there, it is fullness and it is nothingness. So long as I do not have that I am Ness. I no longer have the concept that I am an individual. Then my individuality has merged into this everythingness or nothingness and everything is all right. Visitor, but there is no everythingness, it is nothingness. I do not get the feeling of everythingness. That is what I am trying to say. Maharaj, so if there is nothingness, then who is to do anything anyway? Assuming that there is nothingness, who is there to search for anything, even everythingness? In that nothingness, you are also not there. Then who is it that wants anything more than this? Visitor, I don't know. 
Maharaj, again the answer that you don't know is 100% correct because in that state where you did not know, you did not even know that you existed. And this I amness has come subsequently without your wanting it. And whatever knowledge you have now has been accumulating since the arrival of this I amness. But in your original state, the not knowing is there. Visitor, the problem is where do I go from here? Maharaj, who? The question is who is to go anywhere? It started with the whole thing and the circle is now complete. In that nothingness, we are also nothingness. So who is to go anywhere? For whom are there any more questions left? In that nothingness, anything is nothingness. You are also nothingness. Your question is very much like the child of a childless couple asking where do I go from her? Where is he to go? And from where has he come? I will continue with the same old simile. A very old couple are held in great esteem, love and reverence by all their acquaintances. So the couple dies. All the acquaintances decide that they must do something for the child. But the child had not been born. For whom could they do something? Once the knowledge of the self dawns, there is no longer any question of good or bad, suffering or not suffering, happiness or unhappiness. The question just does not arise. Are there any further questions? Visitor, if the jani is beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, he must contain consciousness. The jani, after all, is the totality. How can that which contains consciousness not be conscious? Maharaj, knowledge, the entire manifestation is the form of knowledge jhana. But the jhani has no form or shape, he has transcended consciousness. Therefore, whatever acts is the universal consciousness and not the jhani. So don't talk any more about the jhani. Rather talk about this consciousness, individual consciousness or the universal consciousness, which is the basis of all your thoughts. So that subject you should discuss. Forget about the Johnny because he is beyond that. And whatever you think the Johnny is talking about, it is not the Johnny talking but the universal consciousness. Whatever you discuss, it can only be on the basis of this I am Ness. Forget about this Johnny aspect, inquire only about Jhana. Visitor, that is where the shoe pinches, this conflict between Jhana and the Johnny. However high you go, however deep you go inwardly, unless you become a jhani, there will always be a path that goes beyond it. One will not be satisfied with the universal consciousness. One will ever want to go further. Maharaj, there is no question of anyone becoming a jhani. The jhani is out of time, so one cannot become one. A jhani in the process of stabilizing in the jhana state possesses for some time the pride of that I am Brahman state, and therefore talks about it. That, however, is not the ultimate jhani state. I will not participate in any concept of yours. Visitor, there are a group of ethical concepts, loyalty, gratitude, justice, keeping one's word, etc. Now it has also been said that this is something beyond good and evil, neither good nor bad, etc., but certain groups of concepts like those I mentioned seem to be inseparably connected to the concept of the man of achievement. In other words, one assumes that such a man would somehow embody these qualities. My question is, is that right or is it just an illusion? Interpreter, what do you mean by a man of achievement? Visitor, a Johnny. Interpreter. Ah, but a man of achievement in the world, that is quite different. Maharaj, all the qualities you mentioned as well as all possible qualities you can imagine are in consciousness or knowledge. The Johnny, however, is beyond all qualities and concepts. Visitor. Okay, I have one supplement to my question. Does such a person want? Interpreter. No, because there is no person. Therefore, all the qualities are in knowledge or the consciousness. The jhani is beyond all concepts and all qualities. He is no longer an individual, therefore whatever applies to an individual does not apply to him. That is the answer to the question. 
All the misconceptions arise because we think of the Johnny as an individual. The Johnny has lost his individuality. Maharaj explains that he is not only not an individual, but he is also beyond the duality of manifestation and non-manifestation. Do you have any questions? Visitor, no. Interpreter, what has happened? No questions. Silence is a good defense, self-protection. Maybe you are afraid to expose yourself. Visitor, is it correct to assume that somebody who is to be what Maharaj talks about will ordinarily manifest the qualities of justice, loyalty, gratitude, honesty, etc.? Maharaj, that is not necessarily so at all. Even a murderer can get knowledge. His past deeds or the absence of these good qualities never come in the way. A classical example is Valmiki who wrote Ramayana. For every murder he committed he put a tiny pebble in a vessel, and in this manner he accumulated seven enormous vessels filled to the brim. All these murders he had committed did not prevent him being a Johnny. Ultimately, all these concepts can and must be understood to be false, but the difficulty and the essential thing is to be convinced that the original, basic concept I am itself is false. You like the talks? Visitor, I like getting answers. Maharaj, having obtained and digested the answers, one's ego must gradually dissipate. If there are no further questions, we will close this meeting. Chapter 7 When Consciousness Manifests, Duality Appears Maharaj, if you want to remember our coming here this morning, treat that as the highest God which gives us the sense of presence, this conscious presence which makes us feel that we are, we exist, we are alive, we are present. If you do, it will unfold itself and gives us all the necessary knowledge. You must have the firmest conviction that this consciousness is our parent principle, the highest God. Then you will have all the necessary knowledge. If there is one principle which can save us, which is our capital, it is that which gives us the sense of presence, this consciousness. Be one with it, pray to it, and treat it as the only God. Whatever we have, whatever we acquire, is only because of this consciousness, and to be one with it we don't require any implements, any instruments, any money. There is no expense involved. This consciousness is free of inhibitions, any conditions, and being without obstructions, it is totally free. If we resort to it, it will also make us free. Visitor, why is it that the Jani is not aware of the universal knowledge? Maharaj, why is the space unaware of anything that has happened? How is it that the sky is not affected by events happening on earth? Behind the four elements, air, water, fire, and earth, the space is always there. Visitor, what is meant by a pure heart? Interpreter, please don't ask frivolous questions. Whatever energy one has to spare, let us spend it on valuable questions. Visitor, one question usually leads to another and there has got to be a starting point somewhere. So a question like this is moving ahead a little bit, stimulating more questions. Interpreter, here it should be just the other way. The frequency or the intensity of questions should be getting less and less. If your questions are multiplying, something must be wrong somewhere. Visitor, yesterday I came here and found the I am, what do I do now? Maharaj, nothing else, that is all. You forget it and go. Visitor, I have been to Turavana Malai quite a number of times in Ramana Maharshi's ashram. A German lady there showed me a book on the teachings of Maharshi and told me a similar teaching and philosophy existed, that given by Maharaj. Maharaj, how long have you been going to Raman Ashram? Visitor, only for the past five years. Interpreter, did you read his book I Am That? Visitor, I only read one or two questions on the subject of death. Maharaj, you have been reading Ramana Maharshi's book and found it interesting. In what way did you find it so with reference to yourself? Visitor, my orientation has been basically Advaita Vedanta so that I have been reading in his book. 
Interpreter, having read those books, would you like to ask any questions? Visitor, I am feeling happy in trying to follow this philosophy. Is there a necessity to meet a living Kuru, or is it sufficient to have faith in a Kuru who has left his body? Maharaj, the aim is to awaken yourself to the faith in the self I am. That is the entire purpose. So whatever is inducive to that development you may accept. Supposing you have faith in a living Kuru, then accept a living Kuru. If you have faith in a Kuru who has left his body, accept that Kuru. Visitor, but is there more benefit to one type over the other? Maharaj, when you were not knowing anything, what was the first thing you came to know in your whole span of life? Visitor, the self. And then came other things. Maharaj, you started with knowing nothing including you did not know yourself. So, what is it that you started knowing first? Visitor, I started reading the Gita reading Krishna. Maharaj, you did not know anything. You did not know yourself either. So where is the scope for Gita? At this time of your life when you were not knowing yourself, what was the first thing you came to know about? You started knowing so many things after you started knowing yourself. You came to know I am and then you came to know other things. How did that happen? Visitor, it happened probably because of my previous karma, my prarabdha karma. Meharaj, these are all stories you have heard. After you came to know yourself, you started knowing so many things. But what knowledge did you have before even you came to know yourself? Visitor, one comes to know all kinds of worldly things, but the world does not bring me any happiness or pleasure. But reading these books, Maharaj, please reply to the question. Visitor, I have probably not understood properly the question. Maharaj, how did you come to know your own self? Afterwards, you can do so many things. How did that happen? Visitor, the self came to know this body. Maharaj, first of all this knowingness appeared, the knowingness I am. Later on you embrace the body. Visitor, correct. Maharaj, hold on to this only and don't ask any questions. I am addressing the consciousness and expounding consciousness in terms of the same consciousness. You came to know yourself, I am. To abide in that is itself the bhakti, the devotion. Before the appearance of I am-ness, where is the devotion? Visitor, I have a question. Maharaj, I have not heard anyone starting questions. I gave you special time for that but you did not speak up. Whatever you have heard applies to you totally and exclusively. Accept that fully. The state you were in before you embraced the body as yourself, that state is the guru of all gurus, that is the Brahman, not even the Brahman, it is the Parabrahman only. Subsequently, you began to fall into grosser states and finally you embraced the body as yourself. Before you occurred to yourself as I am, you were in the highest state, the Guru of the Gurus, the Parabrahman state. Later on you started filling up with all kinds of grosser matters, and you came down to the body sense, I am the body. So all these impurities have to be removed. Until then, you have to stay put in quietude. Your fall started with the appearance of that beingness, I am. With the appearance of this knowingness, I am. The next fall was embracing the body as I am. And then you gathered so many things onto yourself. Hold on to the state of knowing yourself as I am as the truth. All the other things you have gathered to yourself are unreal. To a particular visitor, presently, you are in quietude. Is it on this side of sleep or on the other side? You are only the consciousness feeling the consciousness. Consciousness touches the consciousness. You are heading for that experience known as death of which you have heard. And you have to realize how that death experience is unreal. With all our experience in the world, and notwithstanding all our struggles there, we are heading only towards the inevitability of death. But that death is unreal. 
If death were real, then the death of one animal would signify the end of the entire species. So long as the consciousness I am is not stimulated into knowingness, there is no knowingness at all. That very stimulus that I amness is the source of the entire manifest world of yours. In the absence of the awakening of this I amness, where is the question of mine and thine? Only after the appearance of I amness I and others come into play. Without this I amness there can be neither I am nor others. If you investigate this aspect of spirituality, then there is no question of birth and death. But if you don't investigate this particular aspect, you remain involved in the cycle of birth and death. Visitor, if I know myself, if I realize myself, may there be a transformation in my worldly life? Maharaj, what do you mean by worldly life and what do you mean by transformation? Your worldly life is all your concept, is all your mind only. We are dealing with that principle which is prior to mind. This may be described by saying that you are putting on various shrouds. Before you knew yourself that was your true state. The first shroud was that of I amness, then you embraced the body as yourself, and then so many other shrouds. All these shrouds have to be peeled off including I amness. From the no-knowing state, the first veil I took was that of I am. That was formless, nameless. But I embraced the body, I got a form for myself, I got a name for myself. This was Thifal. Therefore all sages advise, give up the shackles of the body. I am the body, these are the shackles. Give them up. Visitor, how to get rid of this body-mind sense. Maharaj, how to forget. Who remembers and who knows that he remembers and forgets? The one who knows the memory and non-memory states is bodiless. He is prior to body and mind. If you can imbibe totally the essence of what is being said right now, you will stabilize in the Parabrahman state only. You are not beginners in the sphere of spirituality. You have acquired a lot of spiritual wisdom. Now please ask questions. The one who distinguishes between different state, this is with body, that is bodiless, this is this, this is that, stands quite apart from all those things. And you are the one who distinguishes. You are the one that is the purest, the most auspicious, the cleanest. Since that is your state, you are in a position to assess the quality of other states. With this understanding, carry out your worldly life, family life, with full zeal. But the point is this. If you really understand and abide in what I say, naturally your desires and expectations will fall off. Visitor, with the falling off of desires and attachments, there comes a feeling of not wanting to do anything. Maharaj, that leads to the Parabrahman state. What is the use to that state of all the ambitions, expectations, desires? What does it need? Nothing at all, for it is the perfect state. Visitor, you get to the point that you don't care for anything anymore, neither the Brahman state nor anything. Maharaj, yes. You won't care to know that you are the Brahman also in that state. Would you take delivery of this talk, accept all of this? Visitor, a little. Laughter. Interpreter, it is not child's play that he is talking about. Visitor, there just seems to be a total disenchantment with the world. Maharaj, what do you mean by disenchantment? Visitor, it comes as a preference for not wanting to be here, here meaning in the world. Maharaj, it will happen only when you realize I am not like this, not like that, if you eliminate everything. In that state, you will have no color, no design, no form, no name. Visitor, then there is no longer any desire to practice spirituality either. Maharaj, that type of dispassion is called Varajya. Varajya means no raga. Raga means love, love to be. Love to be is also to be discarded. Visitor, that brings along sadness. Maharaj, that is the emotional state, an aspect of the body-mind, this sadness. 
If you are not completely clear of this body-mind sense, the sadness is bound to be there. To two visitors in particular, where nobody was here earlier. I gave both of you a very good opportunity to talk, and now you are itching to talk. Visitor, may I talk now? Maharaj, you shut off all your questions by your previous statement that you had found yourself. That means the object of your spiritual search has been reached. Please explain yourself in greater detail. Before you came here, what were you and after meeting me what are you? I would like to hear. Visitor, before I came here, everything seemed to go on in here in my head and I looked at my body and thought of my body all the time, and I used to be concerned about money, very concerned and also whether or not I would have a job. And sometimes I worked very hard to understand that I am, I read your books and listen to the teachings, I tried very hard to stay in the, I am and I would meditate. Maharaj, and then, Visitor, then I found myself here somehow and I said I am and I knew it. Maharaj, you understood you are? What is the color of that, the design of that? What is the image of that? Visitor, nothing. Maharaj, find it. Then keep quiet. Visitor, unintelligible about the need for disciplines. Maharaj, until you meet your own self I am, the disciplines are all very necessary. Once you abide in your own self they are useless, for then you are no more the body, and no longer concerned with all the disciplines pertaining to that body. Visitor, what about sins and merits after abidance in myself? Maharaj, these are qualities related to the body-mind. So the moment you are no longer the body-mind, these qualities have no further scope with you. First of all, we condition ourselves into the body. We indoctrinate ourselves with the idea I am the body. An example is the air. When the air comes into the body, it is called prana. It is conditioned by the body and confined to the body. Once it is disassociated from the body, that vital breath or prana becomes manifest. It is the universal air. Not only universal air, it becomes the universal space also. So the space is not conditioned by the body. That air is not conditioned by the body. Similarly, your identity is not associated and limited by the body. Therefore, none of the conditionings of the body is binding on you. By your very nature, you are that dynamic manifest consciousness only. No doubt it depends on this quality of I amness on the vital breath. The latter means air only air functioning in the body. This air and the knowingness cause the I amness. Out of prana grows the world, and world means the mind. All that construes you. So when the vital breath quits, there is no more I amness, but that does not die off and remain like a dead body. Visitor, what is liberation? Meharaj, when you are liberated from the body-mind sense so that you are not the body-mind, that itself is liberation. My language may not satisfy you, but don't get upset by that. You should try to understand the meaning behind my words. When you are really liberated, when you firmly come to the conclusion I am not the body, nor the vital breath, the illumination is perfect. Are you the vital breath? Pay attention to the vital breath. Are you the language because you can voice the language? Can you be the language? Similarly, I lead you to consciousness. You are in a position to watch consciousness, therefore, you cannot be the consciousness. You must fully employ your faculty of discrimination and investigate. Before we are caught up with this body-mind sense, we are the parabrahman only, but the moment this I amness appears, we embrace this body-mind as ourself and then we are involved with all the concepts and all the problems of the world. That knowingness, that realization has no color. For one who has realized all this, there is Brahman, the godly state, and the one who knows this godly state is the parabrahman state. Visitor, to one who knows the Brahman state does the world still appear? Maharaj, when it is a qualitative I am state the world is. 
Once this state is transcended, there is no world. In the I amness in the consciousness, the manifest world is there. In the no I amness state, there is no world. The knower of this I amness state and the world, within that knower state, there is no world. But in the I amness state, there is a world. Visitor, but the knower that knows the world, the Parabrahman knows the world? Maharaj, pointing to his cigarette lighter, you see that flame is like I amness. When the I amness appears, the world also appears. You like Parabrahman is watching that. When there is no flame, you see nothing. When the flame is there, I amness has appeared, therefore, the world has appeared. Visitor, so in Parabrahman, you can know both the world and no world. Maharaj, everything depends on the appearance of that consciousness. If that consciousness is there, then also witnessing of the world happens. If there is no consciousness, then there is no world. Why do you know anything right now? Visitor, because I am. Maharaj, because of that I am Ness. You know the world. A hundred years back, you did not know anything. Then you were the Parabrahman because the I am Ness was not yet there. Visitor, can't I still be the Parabrahman now? Maharaj, this is no joke but you can become Parabrahman right now. Only it is not a commodity that you can acquire. You a hundred years ago were the Parabrahman. Give me all the information about that state of a hundred years back. Focus your attention only on that consciousness I am. Don't be led astray by all the so-called spiritual disciplines and rigmaroles. Visitor, does this consciousness within the body have anything to do with the universal consciousness? Maharaj, one is the expression of the other. If the pulse were not there, could that which is considered the individual body do anything in the world? The life force, the breath, is the expression of the mind and the consciousness. When you talk of one, the others have to be there. All the three are made one complex. Without one, the others can't work. Now, the difficulty arises because what this consciousness is is at once the universal consciousness that is, the feeling of presence, I am presence. And not, I am present where you are present where he is present. But unfortunately, the identification is with the body, and I am not the whole but a divisible part of the whole. And therefore one thinks in terms of acquiring something. But when one sees the situation as it really is that no individual is involved, that what is present is presence as a whole and merely the expression of the absolute, then the moment this is perceived there is liberation. Liberation is nothing else than seeing this with full conviction. Visitor, what is the relationship between consciousness and the body? Maharaj, the consciousness in order to manifest itself must have a form. And the form is the body, and the body is made up of the essence of the five elements, constituting the sustenance for the consciousness. Without sustenance in the form of the body, whichever body it may be, that of a worm, an insect or a human being, consciousness could not sustain itself. It is the food essence which sustains consciousness. Visitor, if the various forms of manifestation are merely the expression of universal consciousness, why is there the feeling of individuality in different forms? Why should each form consider itself a separate one? Maharaj, as soon as that which is the unicity manifests itself, the very manifestation signifies duality. Manifestation means there has to be a subject and an object. Manifestation in space-time means divisibility. And it is the very nature of consciousness that as soon as it manifests itself, there are the opposites, evil and good, large and small, etc. From the moment the manifestation takes place, duality is its very nature, and this must express itself. As soon as there is this manifestation, there is the question of duality, even in the five elements. The air, fire, and water are themselves opposites. So the manifestation itself means duality. 
If I say that I am ill, what does it mean really? For the sake of communication, one uses the word I. But strictly speaking, I have nothing to do with the form. The illness is on that because of which the form is made and is felt in the consciousness. And I am really neither the form nor the consciousness which manifests itself in the form. But for the sake of communication, one says I am ill. I am worse, I have grown weak or I have grown stronger, but that is merely an expression of the change in the essence of the form. But growing weaker or stronger, undergoing illness or otherwise, has nothing to do with as such. There are innumerable languages, not only among human beings but also among forms of being other than the human being. But that on which the language is based, that is, the mind and the consciousness, does not change. The conditioning which has taken place on that consciousness right from the beginning is the basis of the language of that particular form. Therefore there are innumerable forms in any number of languages. Now there is a very subtle point and analogy regarding the ordinary language which we know and the spiritual language which we do not yet know. That to which one has been conditioned right from the beginning, that language does not need any special effort for anyone to learn. He or she gets used to it from early childhood, from the earliest conditioning. How? Through constant and consistent association. Similarly, if one has this constant and consistent association with the Jhanis, then that language which the Jhani speaks, and which would normally not be understood by people, will gradually be remembered and understood and become natural. Since when does one come to know the experience of suffering? Only since form was created out of the five elements and there was consciousness in that form. But what was the situation before the form was created and the consciousness came into it? One was unmanifest. One had no knowledge of one's existence. There was no question of any experience, and therefore there was a state which was beyond the gross concept of happiness or unhappiness. That was the unicity when there was not even any question of having experience. In the unmanifest absolute, there is no consciousness at all, consciousness of existence. So only when there is this universal consciousness manifesting itself in the various forms, and these forms possess the life force and are subject to the three gunas, can each form act through the life force according to the combination of these gunas. Each form acts according to its own nature. It is only when identification takes place, and I begin to think that I am acting, although it is only the combination of the three gunas that acts, that I assume quite unnecessarily the responsibilities and consequences of those actions, which properly are not mine at all. The actions would have taken place in any case, depending on the three gunas and the life force. It is amazing, almost silly, that anyone could think that he or she is acting. This is what happens. The waking state before the other gunas start is from the savaguna, that is, total harmony. In that split second when one wakes up, there is total love, total kindness. There is no question of selfishness. So the waking state is of the quality of the subsequently. There are the physical activities caused by necessities, nature and duties. These derive from the rajas guna. All these activities take place by themselves, but one starts saying I am doing this, identifying and taking on the responsibilities, that is the work of the Tamas Guna. Chapter 8 Who Knows That I Am? Maharaj, take the case of someone who says I don't like what Maharaj is saying so he gets up and walks out. What has happened? He has reacted to the meaning of a particular word or set of words which has come from the mind. So the mind says, I don't like what is being said, and that thought is converted into words. And again the mind takes the meaning of these words that I don't like this, and the action takes place of his walking out. If similarly as the basis of all thought one accepts some definite principle, then all one's future actions will be based on it. This firm base is the result of accepting the meaning of the word which has come from a particular thought. 
My guru told me that I am para Brahman and nothing else. I have accepted that with great conviction, and therefore whatever other things appear seem to me palpably false. At one stage, for example, I was extremely strong. Fifteen or twenty years later, I had to use a stick. And later on, even the stick becomes useless. So all these changes in the body are not mine. Whatever disease has come, it refers to the area of body only. All thoughts that come will be based on the firm primary thought I am the Parabrahman. Unless one adheres to this fundamental principle, and most of us don't, we accept that we are the body and continue as such till our deaths. But if the Kiru's words are accepted with total conviction, our entire destiny, our entire life will be transformed. I am splitting off what you are in yourself from whatever thoughts that occur to you. I stated you are not the thoughts but that if you embrace the thoughts as yourself you actually become the thoughts. So I drive a wedge between you and those thoughts, between you and your assimilation of any thoughts or words. Earlier I had said that you become the sum total of all the thoughts and whatever meanings you attach to them. You are the victim of the thoughts of the meaning of the words which you entertain as yours. I gave you the example of that fellow who had accepted the meaning of the words I have been offended, had wholly swallowed the concept and so made it his own. In driving that wedge I say you are apart from thought or the meaning of the words. Where Savaguna, Rajas Guna and Tamas Guna. Savaguna is doing all the tricks, and you say I am doing this, you accept the actions of Savaguna, Rajas Guna and Tamas Guna as your own. You are not that either. There is the example of the married woman who had been in the family way for three months, and somebody made a forecast that the fetus is that of a very great person of the standing of Lord Bhagavan Sri Krishna. The child to be born will be as great or even superior to Lord Krishna. That concept or that thought is given. So this lady accepts the thought in toto, embracing the thought its meaning as herself, the child must be born as great as Krishna. The sickness of which I am accused, of which my body is accused, is actually a great blessing, because it is not what I am. But it is also like that lady in the family way. I am also in the same state. That lady, because of the concept given to her, would indeed believe that her child is as great as Krishna. Similarly, my guru has given me this conception that I am the Parabrahman. So that is always there. So then what is the impact of this sickness? The sickness is going to deliver me into the Parabrahman state because I have accepted Parabrahman as my real nature. I am the Parabrahman only. So this sickness is helping the delivery into the Parabrahman. Therefore, the culmination of the sickness is Parabrahman. You are a slave to the meaning of words, to the meaning of the mind. Therefore, you are the victim of the mind. Who accepts this conviction? It is not the mind. The deep sense in you that you are must accept that you are the Parabrahman, not the mind. Don't be a slave to the meaning which the mind imposes on you. The culmination of that sickness in me is Parabrahman only, but for others having this sickness there will be panic that they are going to die. This is the normal concept of ordinary people. But for one who is firmly convinced that he is the Parabrahman, I would almost say, whatever the self is, that the self is convinced that it is Parabrahman, then the sickness is a blessing, because the sickness helps to deliver one into Parabrahman. Who has the knowledge I am? Somebody in you knows the knowledge I am. Who is it? It is very obvious that you know you are, but what or who is it that knows you are? Visitor, I ask that question too. Who knows I am? Maharaj, am I to reply that you are sitting here? You know you are sitting here. And you are asking me. You must understand why I am asking this question. Unashamedly, you are asking me to reply to your question. Interpreter, you see the point is we have to go to our very core, the whole idea is not to reply superficially. So what is the point in asking others to reply to your question? Visitor, because it sounded like a rhetorical question. 
Interpreter, we are to be prior to I am Ness. Then Maharaj want us to study ourselves and find out whatever it is. There may not be a verbal reply. At least we must try to understand what he is driving at. Visitor, I understand that. Second visitor, is it pure awareness that knows I am? Maharaj, yes, that's right. Who can understand that illusory state? I am Ness is illusory only. It is not a perfect state, it is illusion. Who knows the illusion? A non-illusory state only can know the illusory state. You are not wrong in your reply, but why did you say pure awareness? What is the necessity of your saying pure? Visitor, there was no necessity. Maharaj, awareness means pure. Since awareness knows I am. It is other, it is more than I am. That is the highest, there is no gradation in awareness. In the absolute, the parabrahman state, there is no question of impure awareness or pure awareness. Visitor, is there love in pure awareness? Maharaj, no. What do you mean by love? What is your experience, your idea of love? Visitor, something much higher than the love that the mind and the body have. Something that is formless. Maharaj, up to the state of beingness I am Ness consciousness, there is the state of love. That love is the love to be. This love to be is not the perfect state, but when transcended, it is the perfect state. No imperfections. Visitor, you say up to the point of beingness, is that when you are still in the absolute? Interpreter, the no-being state is the absolute, that is what you call pure awareness. Beingness is the feeling I am. That I am itself is love to be. I would like to be. I would love to perpetuate myself. Visitor, and where is love? Maharaj, that is love. Consciousness itself is love. With consciousness you would love to be. Visitor, and in pure awareness. Maharaj, there is no I amness. There is no consciousness. Visitor, and no love. Maharaj, in love to be you want to have something, right? Some desire is there, the love to continue to be. In the Parabrahman there is no love to be because it is a perfect state. Visitor, what is the purpose if the Absolute is up there? What is the purpose of the Absolute coming to birth in a form? Maharaj, why do you ask such an elementary question? I will give some example. You want to go to a particular place to visit. You are that need. Because of that need you love to go. Love is the motive force, it moves you. Similarly, when you are beingness, the beingness wants to continue. It wants to continue in time and space. That is the state of love to be. So love is there only in the state of beingness. In the perfect state, that state does not want to become something other than what it is. Nor does it want to be. Therefore that beingness is not there, the feeling of I amness is not present in the perfect state. Everything is complete. When your need is fulfilled, there is no more need, no more lack. There is no more movement. Love is also dissolved at that moment. Suppose you want to go to a place, some faraway station. You rush to the station to catch the train. Why are you rushing? Because you wish to reach your destination. Once you reach it, you don't rush anymore. You stay put in quietude. You forget the movement also, there is no more rushing. Again, I am not addressing an individual or personality. I am addressing that final outcome of the five elemental food essence, I am Ness. You are not the personality or the individual. The quintessence of this food, which in turn is the outcome of the five elemental play, is the taste I am. I am is not a personality nor an individual. For example, you want to employ a servant. And there is a very weak fellow whom you want to convert into a good servant. He is very weak and cannot perform. 
So you bring him good food, good nourishment, and then he becomes stronger and steady. Then finally, is it not the food that has made him into a good servant? The good quality of the food that you gave him is converted into service for you. Similarly, what are medicines? Is not medicine also a type of food? An antidote to a deficiency of a particular food in your body is administered in the form of medicine. Therefore, who is serving that servant? Is it not the food essence? And with respect to your own body, who is serving you? Is it not the food essence that is a good servant to you? Does all this knowledge that is exposed here confuse you? Normally, what is happening is that people assume themselves to be human forms, and they try to understand everything through filter of that human form. They translate whatever I say into the mode of thinking of a human being, a personalized human being. That is the trouble. I am addressing that principle, that touch of I am, that consciousness which is the product of the food essence body. To a particular visitor, you are not yet very clear. Visitor, I thought I was fairly clear. You can't really judge me from what I say. What I say might belie my understanding. Maharaj, you are of the firm conviction that you understood? Visitor, no. There are certain things that one understands at certain levels, but from the totality nothing was understood. Maharaj, did you say the highest level or the totality? Visitor, totality. Maharaj, what did you mean by totality? Visitor, when one remains in the I am there is no knowledge, no thought, no movement. Maharaj, when you are only being are there no thoughts? Visitor, no. Maharaj, the very consciousness is the potential for thought activity. Visitor, there is a potential for thought, but if it is not exercised there is no thought. Maharaj, when the consciousness is there thoughts will spontaneously come or they may not. You have no control over that whatsoever. It is exclusively the business of the consciousness to have thoughts or no thoughts. Visitor, but we were talking about the universal consciousness as having no thoughts and no mentation. That being so, where then is the thought? If we are told to be and to remain in I am, where then is the thought? Maharaj, leave it for now and stop thinking. Maharaj, what I am telling you, you are not in a position to understand and what you are telling me I don't understand. So what is the use of more talk? Visitor, well it wasn't my intention to imply that I knew anything. I felt I knew a few things relativity wise but now I realize that I know nothing and that is due to Maharaj's grace. Maharaj, since you are talking from the standpoint that you understand nothing still you are asking questions. So how am I to understand them? The type and the quality of questions which emerges from you indicates that you are not understanding what I am driving at. The whole object of the dialogue is for you to understand what I am saying and that I understand what you are asking. If this is not the case then what is the purpose of a dialogue at all? I am not well, I shall be talking only crisply and to the point. No digression. Many people have listened to my talks, have understood and have gone into quietude. If people cannot understand me what can I do about that? If my talks cannot be understood, it is no use attending them. This morning I asked a question, who knows I am? And you asked me a counter question, what should I understand by that? May you keep quiet, don't ask any further questions today. Maharaj, in the morning when you asked that question I thought you were trying to be argumentative. Visitor, I apologize for your feeling that way. My question in return to yours was perhaps facile. It was, however, not meant to be argumentative. I felt there was an answer to that question that I perhaps did not know. But in truth I did know the answer and I do understand what you have been saying. Yet at times with the knowledge that is being absorbed one feels that one does not really understand after all, yet the knowledge is absorbed. Who is there to know? And that is all I wanted to convey. Maharaj, I felt as if you are trying to attack or challenge me by your questioning. 
you should be quiet when there is no answer coming out of you. You should not ask me to reply, for that question was meant for you, for your opening up. Don't ask questions for some time. Don't ask any questions to challenge me. To another visitor, were you here in India earlier? Visitor, this is my first time. Three days in India. Maharaj, you are already full of spiritual wisdom. You know a lot in spirituality, and I am in no position to address you. I am a pygmy before you. Do you have questions? To a particular visitor, what happened to your question? Visitor, I try to understand that level where there should be no more questions. Why should I come down to this level and put questions in this ease? Maharaj, what happened to your question? Visitor, they are in the beginning. But in the ultimate state, there are no questions. Why should I come down to a low level to ask questions? Maharaj, who invited you to step down into questions? Interpreter, if you don't want to ask questions, what is the point of meeting him? Maharaj, in the morning I clearly told you I am not addressing you as a person, as an individual. I am addressing you as the expression of the consciousness. In these dialogues there is no question of I and you. This consciousness is the product of the food body essence and is talking to that expression of the consciousness. You always assume that whatever occurs to you is knowledge, but it is really a concept. True knowledge is beyond concept prior to concept. The conceptless, wordless, speechless state is knowledge. The trouble is that a foreign concept occurs to you, you like it, then you give it a title, you remember the title and you call it knowledge and are satisfied with it. How can you speak or develop any concept unless the primary concept I am is available? This primary concept begets further concepts, that is, all other concepts occur to it. We call it God Ishvara and such names, and all that we call knowledge. This primary concept illuminates all those concepts which later become my knowledge. However, whatever concept occurs to you, including the primary concept I am, is not the eternal state. This primary concept occurred to you, then you called it Brahman Ishvara. Because you like it, because you like to be, you give it these glorious names as mentioned. But with all that it is still only a concept. Why is it not eternal? Because its very foundation is this food body only. So long as the food body is available in proper balance and proper condition, that or any other concept will be sustained. Now where is your sample available in this? It is not to be found in you as the absolute. Only the sample of the food essence in the form of a touch of I amness is available. I am telling you my story. And while I am narrating my story to you, it means that you are getting to know your own self. If you understand my story, you will also understand your own story. Abide in yourself. Actually Lord Krishna expounded his story, but he gave it the glorious name of Brahman Vidya, the knowledge of Brahman. Can anything good or bad happen to the Brahman Vidya, knowledge of the self? Since nothing good or bad can happen to that Brahman, that Parabrahman is known as Nishkama, the desireless Parabrahman state. The knowledge of beingness, the knowledge of the self, is like the utility of an unborn child. It has absolutely no use. Similarly, this Brahman Vidya in final analysis is of no use. Most of the so-called Jhanis unjustifiably thought that they had the knowledge through certain concepts which they valued very much. They glorified the concepts by giving them various high value to names. And they hung on to those particular concepts as their creed, religion, or profound knowledge. Even this primary concept, I am Ness, is dishonest just because it is still only a concept. Finally, one has to transcend that also and be in the Nirvikalpa state, which means the concept-free state. Then you have no concept at all, not even of I am. In that state one does not know that one is. This state is known as Parabrahman, Brahman transcended. 
Brahman is manifest, Parabrahman is beyond that prior to that, the Absolute. Do you understand what I am driving at? Whatever you caught in your attention, that attention should eventually turn into no attention. The state that is finally left over is awareness. Parabrahman. I am addressing the consciousness. The instrument of consciousness for comprehension is attention. Anything is absorbed in the attention and whatever is really understood goes through that attention, which itself is then dissolved into and is consciousness. So what remains? No concept is left. Thus attention also turns into no attention. With the arrival of consciousness it occurs to you that you are, simultaneously I am occurs to you or in your attention. So when the consciousness is not there, attention is also not there. Subsequent to the arrival of consciousness and attention, everything else crept in. Now let us assume that through your attention you are able to embrace the entire manifest universe. When your consciousness is not there, where is that attention which embraced the entire universe? Therefore, the is that principle where there is no question of a person transcends this I amness state. It is the no I amness state. The jani dismisses the consciousness. A jani has no scope at all for any pride, because there are no props left for supporting his pride. The absolute state is prior to consciousness, it means the unborn state. Since the Parabrahman is the unborn state prior to consciousness, can it have an iota of knowledge? An unborn child does not know of his existence. Similarly, the Parabrahman state does not know itself that it is. My words are only rooted in the Absolute. You must be able to divine any meaning out of them. The principle that understands relationships and tries to understand, still exists in the realm of consciousness, it is in the realm of attention, but that to which it points has no attention in it. Visitor, if you harness your attention there is only silence. Maharaj, up to the precipice of consciousness into the abysmal depth. Visitor, it is like drilling a hole in the desert, if water comes you don't have to do anything anymore. Maharaj, whatever I say cannot be grasped by your intelligence. It is beyond the scope of the intellect. Every living being, every person, every species, tries to preserve itself. That is the work of the very life force. But have we any knowledge about that life force? This I am Ness. The touch of the consciousness will be sustained so long as this food essence quality is retained. Once the quality is gone, the consciousness cannot be sustained. This is the product of the five elemental play. I repeat, so long as that five elemental food quintessence is available, the consciousness will be there. Once the quality is lost, the consciousness will also be lost. Is it possible for you to preserve the quality of these five elements perpetually? When you take this organic food essence, moisture must be present. And water is bound to dry up one day. Therefore the food essence is also bound to dry up and so consciousness is time bound. Eventually it will disappear. How can you retain that pride that I am like this? This I am business depends entirely on the food essence. So how can you retain it perpetually that I shall remain like this only? To extract any essence, water is very necessary, and the water quality is bound to dry up. At this point, if you want to ask anything, please go ahead. If you are in a position to dwell on this theme about your identity, please speak up. Interpreter, I told Maharaj you know about Bhagavad Gita and so many scriptures. He says, all that is very interesting, but you ought to remember what is the primary support. You must be, must you not? Visitor, I did not want to ask any questions. The knowledge of the scriptures has not brought about what we desire. For that, grace and satsang are vital. Maharaj, what is the meaning of the word truth? We understand what is unreal, that which is not going to last. But what is the meaning of real? What is the meaning of truth? 
it is whatever is eternal. Whatever we experience, including the beingness, is unreal because it is not going to last. These are all non-eternal, and one experiences only non-eternal items. The knowledge I am is a primary concept, and is also non-eternal. The one, the absolute, which is eternal and aware, why should he worry about anybody else? Because in that state, whatever appearance takes place is that only. There is no other, so the question about any inquiry about others does not even arise. Eternal means, now and forever. When the state is now and forever, why should one worry about anything else? Whatever is eternal is the truth. That state transcends knowledge and ignorance, so there is no scope for knowledge and also ignorance. You may call it jhana, you may give it a fancy title, but actually, it is beyond jhana and a jhana, knowledge and ignorance. It is a most fascinating state radiant. Brilliant glorious, you can give it all sorts of titles. It is like the unborn child, the child of a barren woman. The truth is like that. The eternal is like that. The eternal means the unborn. Visitor, Maharaj may have realized that, but how are we to realize that state? Maharaj, what do you mean by realizing that state? And what is that state? The child of a barren woman. Visitor, I meant that which is eternal and now, as you were saying. Maharaj, yes, I said that about that state, brilliant, glorious, etc., but it is like the unborn child. Chapter 9 Consciousness itself is the source of illusion. Maharaj, that state referred to as the unborn child. I have tried to describe it as brilliant, glorious, etc., but it is really mind-boggling. You can't try to use your mind or intelligence to understand it. Give it up. Don't communicate all this to others, but you chase it, you pursue it, and be that. Don't be lazy. How can anybody put questions on this thing, which is being discussed? It is nice to hear those particular words and statements which click at that moment, giving momentary satisfaction. But this is something different. This is going to change you. Any experience or any satisfaction that you get is momentary, meant for that time only. Once that time is gone, the satisfaction is gone and everything is over. Visitor, then what is permanent and how to achieve the permanent? Maharaj, understand whatever is time-bound and eliminate all time-bound stages. The one who recognizes all these time-bound stages, that one is beyond time, is prior to time. They put there. You can understand all these time-bound stages only from a pedestal which is not time-bound. Be there. Visitor, how to reach it? Maharaj, follow it up. There are no further words that can be applied to explain it further. Visitor, by what means, rituals, or procedures can it be attained? Maharaj, is it not beyond effort, beyond understanding? When you are the instrument of understanding, all sources of the intellect are kept aside. Whatever remains is that state. Presently, we are fully in the grasp of this beingness or consciousness. Consciousness is the product of this food essence body. Whatever occurs to this beingness is knowledge, maybe even profound knowledge, and we cling to that. But that is not the true knowledge. Beingness is the product of the food essence. It cannot be eternal knowledge because it is time-bound. Do you understand that? Don't try to give thought after understanding a little bit of this. Try to absorb and imbibe this fully until you stabilize in your true self. Visitor, I have not understood myself fully, so the question of giving it up simply cannot arise. Maharaj, that I am Ness is again the product of this food body. Where is the question of knowing that also? What you call yourself or you is the product of this food essence body. How can that beingness understand you, the truth, you the absolute? To the ignorant one can give a talk depending heavily on spiritual jargon about the Brahman, about this and that, all the stories. However, when it comes to yourself, you must really understand the true self. You are alive as a concept, and it is false. 
In this body there is the principle which we know as yourself. That principle has no form, but you understand that as the knowledge I am. We also call it the consciousness, the I consciousness, or the beingness. Now the various names are the names of this consciousness only. The consciousness gives rise to the world. The world is within that consciousness. Try to understand that. This is the only way to knowledge of the self. Through this consciousness, you can know yourself what you are. All other types of knowledge in the world are ways to enable you to earn a livelihood, to get money and live in the world. Otherwise, that is not knowledge at all. Knowledge of the self is the only real knowledge. In the universal consciousness, there are no individuals. We are looking at different forms. We give them names like man, god, donkey and such. But ultimately there is this consciousness only, the universal consciousness. And we should not identify ourselves as a separate entity, a separate body. We are that knowledge, it has no name or form. That is the essence of my teaching. Two college students had come here. I told them, forget spirituality, follow your normal inclinations, tendencies, do your normal duties, just give up spirituality. Why did I talk to them like this? I got involved in spirituality, in the business of spirituality, and finally I lost that love of the self also. I have no more love for the self. That is the reason. A chief anchor for anybody is the love for the self consciousness, the I love state, the main bonding. I started spirituality in the name of self knowing only because I loved myself, I love to be. And I wanted to know what is God. And to know that means spirituality. So in this bargain I lost that, I am no longer fascinated by that love to be. Because that is the main bondage, the main condition that I love. So long as the vital breath operates, so long as the pulse will be beating, until then there is this love to be, until then there is the consciousness. When the vital breath quits the body, the pulse will stop and I am Ness's no more. Since my love to be is now completely finished, exhausted, I have no more fascination for that state of I love. Therefore I have no more love for anybody. We normally involve ourselves in loving somebody else from the main standpoint that I love to be. I call this our skull and earthen pot. So long as this earthen pot is not properly baked, you have to collect knowledge from elsewhere. When it is properly baked, and it sounds well, then you will be in a position to understand of what I am talking. But what will happen after you listen to my talks? The shell will burst, it will crack. Ritually, while cremating the body, the sun has to light the fire. Then we will take an earthen pot full of water and put that in a small hole we have made, and then he will move round that funeral pyre in a wrong direction. Normally, the direction is by keeping the object to the right, moving clockwise, but here the object is kept to the left, so he will be moving counterclockwise. And after some three perambulations, he will throw the mud pot at the back, not in front, and he will go on chanting. So like that, when you come here, you will be cremating yourself. Whatever identity you have, whatever idea you have about your own self will be cremated. Would you like this type of knowledge which I am exposing here? This love to be, this consciousness, unsolicited spontaneously, it has come for no reason. And since then, it occupies itself with all activities. All these worldly activities are only due to that self-love, love to be. But self-love is not real. It cannot be eternal, it is a passing phase. All this knowledge and final analysis is of no use. Since you will liquidate that very consciousness, finally whatever you have heard here is of no use. Because only within the realm of consciousness is knowledge innocent. Having heard whatever I have said, if you retain it in your memory and because of your association with that knowledge, some new knowledge also will sprout in you. All this is of no use really. 
but it has one use, you will be able to parade your knowledge before the ignorant masses, and you have a chance to become a guru. With whatever knowledge you originally had plus the knowledge you have heard, and the knowledge which has sprouted in you, when you finally understand and realize all that, you definitely will come to the conclusion that it is all unreal of no use. Nevertheless, having realized that, you will have a certain stature and spirituality and people will be flocking to you listen to what you say. At that stage, whatever occurs to you, you can just blurt it out. Because for the ignorant masses that will be profound knowledge. But in this bargain, what will happen is that you will be elevated to a very high stature as a guru. So be aware of that. The main capital, the only primary capital that anybody has is only this, deep sleep waking state and that little touch of I amness nothing else. Any questions here? Visitor, how does one link up with consciousness? Maharaj, how are you linked with sleep? Visitor, that is a natural state. Maharaj, this is also natural. You are linked with consciousness as a natural state. Visitor, how do you realize it? I have tried to be calm and listen to myself, but it is in no way my natural state. Maharaj, right now the body is real, the world is real for you. And you have now the waking state, deep sleep in the knowledge I am. How long is this going to remain true or real to you? Without this waking state, deep sleep and you are not there, nor the world, nor the body. How long were you associated with these three states? Right now you are fully associated with them. Visitor, looking at myself, all my life has been associated with those states. Maharaj, are you sure? What do you mean by my whole life? Life means a certain life span from one day to a hundred years. After a hundred years, no more association of this. Visitor, what I difficult is to become detached from myself and see myself as an illusion. Maharaj, that is because you have identified yourself with this body. I am with the body. That is why it is so difficult. Have you any other identity but for the body? Visitor, I am trying hard to detach myself. Maharaj, you must. But your true nature cannot be clasped or grasped. Whatever you catch hold of cannot be real. Visitor, how do you get to the true nature? Maharaj, once you reject what you are not, whatever finally remains the leftover is yourself, your true nature. Presently, whatever you know is I am. This I am is the product of the five elements. Out of the elements comes the food body and because of the food body, that I am Ness is sustained. And you are also not that I am. I am is the taste or the fragrance of this food body. The ultimate has no fragrance, no taste, no touch of I amness. Visitor, but don't we need the mind to turn us into an inner direction first? Maharaj, yes, but before you start thinking of turning your mind inward, hold on to yourself whatever you are. You know you are, just be there. Maharaj, when you did not have the body, whatever you might have done, can you recollect anything? Visitor, no. Second visitor, the scriptures say that we have our karma and our sins, and that is why we are here. Maharaj, that is for the ignorant masses. One who has realized the self-knowledge I am. For him these stories are of no use. Visitor, is all this the concept of prerabhya? Maharaj, you are talking of destiny. What is the destiny of this? Destiny is like the lighter and the fuel contained in it. The five elemental juice is the prerupt of the destiny. Whatever it is that sustains the consciousness, that is the destiny. If you think you are interested in spirituality, I am dissuading you. If you follow any other vocation except spirituality, you have some hope that you will succeed sometime. But if you enter spirituality, all your hopes will ultimately be shattered. You will be left with no hopes nor expectations. So I again advise you, don't jump into this spiritual thing. If you do that, you will be licking without a tongue, you will be left with nothing. You might even invite your own death. 
Death will be there. Death will meet you. You will be shivering in your shoes. Who is that recipient intimate relation who is going to receive all the sufferings? It is only that entity with three aspects, waking state, deep sleep, and the knowingness that is suffering or enjoying. What else have you? Just as hair grows out of your head, so all the mental aspects or phenomena grow out of your consciousness. Visitor, for the past ten years I have been reading and studying Ramana Maharshi and also Morris Fridnan. I have been talking to him. Now I have a problem as to which type of sadhana to pursue. And the feeling of fulfillment clarity has been eluding me. I am in a state of indecision to choose from among Ramana Maharshi, Morris Fridman and Maharaj. Maharaj, I advise you to give up spirituality and follow your vocation. What is the sum total of the body of work, the conclusion of the thoughts, of the three men you have referred to? Visitor, one has to gain confidence and make a decision and act according to the truth, which I am obviously unable to do because of my lack of confidence. Maharaj, to grow in self-confidence, hold on to your primary capital that you are. You are means, waking state, deep sleep and the touch of I amness. That is your primary capital by which you know that you are. Hold on to that, abide therein, worship that as your only guru. In the absence of this triad, waking state, deep sleep and I amness, what are you? What have you? Visitor, conflict of indecision. Maharaj, in the absence of the waking state, deep sleep and I am Ness, have you anything? Visitor, I think that is all. All the three we have. Maharaj, the meaning of this triad is you. You are your consciousness, the state I love to be. To this particular visitor, please continue. Visitor, I want Maharaj's blessing and hope that I can go to Raman Ashram for some time. There are two things that are trying to keep me back in the sense that I must do this, must do that. My relatives and friends might feel bad about me because I have been unstable for the last 15 years and this year again Maharaj says that all hopes, all plans, all expectations will be shattered. So this will be one more shattering. But all the same I want. Let the shattering happen and let me be peaceable in Raman Ashram. I want Maharaj's support to move on. Maharaj, you are going to stay there permanently or you are going to retrace your steps. Visitor, that I don't know I want to go all the same, one, two, three, four months, as long as possible. Maharaj, eventually you will find shelter and peace in no other ashram except your very own. That visranti, it means, ultimate relaxation, final abidance, will be available only in your ashram and nowhere else. The road is inward into your ashram. Visitor, the real ashram within I have yet to discover. Meharaj, the real profound meaning of ashram is the firm conviction that I am. That is the inner abode. Where do we stay? We stay in the society of I Ness and in the house of I Ness only. Visitor, why would the world be created as an illusion? It seems real to us but it is not. Maharaj, nobody created it. Spontaneously it has come about. Prior to knowing this knowingness, I am Ness, where is the illusion? Prior to the consciousness, where was the illusion? The primary illusion is only this knowingness I am. Prior to that there was no illusion. This very consciousness is the source of illusion. This illusion or consciousness or I am Ness does not remain as something eternal. It is liberated, this non-eternal consciousness is liberated. When the knowingness is transformed into non-knowingness, that is the liberation. Visitor, our illusion in our present consciousness. Maharaj, the present consciousness itself is illusion. Visitor, that is right. Our illusion of the present consciousness is time, is it not? Maharaj, take the example of the dream world. You have the feeling that you woke up. Actually you are in deep sleep on the bed. You have the illusion that you woke up and out of this illusion the dream world is born. Similarly with this illusion. 
Although not in the waking state, the apparent feeling that I woke up that itself creates a dream world. Visitor, how do you wake up then out of this dream world? Maharaj, you have to go into quietude, you have to be still. Visitor, what do you look for when you are still? Maharaj, you must look at yourself. You meet the consciousness. Consciousness must look at the consciousness. I am Ness must look at the I am Ness. Visitor, where do you look? Is it in you behind you? Meharaj, it is neither looking backward, forward, or upside down. Just be as you are. Just be. Do nothing. Although I am not very knowledgeable spiritually, I am posing very relevant questions. You assume that you are knowledgeable spiritually, but you are not able to ask very relevant questions. Anyone else who wants to talk? If anything occurs to you, please speak, but don't just speak about irrelevant things. If you are inclined towards social work, by all means follow that inclination. Visitor, but as Maharaj has said, that if you follow the path of spirituality, all that you plan, social work, good works, or whatever it is, outward going, they will all be shattered. But I am asking, can the inward journey and outward expression be done harmoniously? Meharaj, the mind flow is always external, never internal. In the inward journey of self-discovery, that external mind flow comes to a complete halt. So when you are going inward into yourself, you will not have the mental inclinations to flow outward like doing social work. That is a natural corollary. It is possible to do both things simultaneously in some fashion, but when you are truly seriously going inward the mind flow stops altogether. There will be no more outgoing movement. Have you understood? So whether you want to be preserved or perish, you must stick to your determination. Visitor, I picked up from yesterday's conversation your advice that we must give up our self-love. Is that correct? Maharaj, some of us misunderstand. I knew they would. You see, the self-love is the one thing that is, I call it consciousness, the sense of existence, the sense that I am. And because that is, everything is. If one were not conscious, one would not see the world. So with this love for this beingness, one wants that consciousness, existence, to continue. So the love for this I am-ness is the one thing which has to be there. But don't identify that love with the body that you think you are. That is the one thing that exists. Not the self-love, that is the love for this beingness, that which gives one the sense of being, existing I am. That love must be there, but don't. Visitor, not the love for the body. Maharaj, no but that I am Nest, don't let it identify itself with the body, that is nothing. What is this body? The body is nothing but good food, and the essence of that good food is the I am, and this body is the sustenance for this this I am Ness consciousness. The body weren't there, the consciousness would not be there. So this consciousness needs the body, but it is not the body. That is the fundamental understanding. It is a necessity. Keep one thing very clearly in mind. You are not God. You are not the body which is going to die. And if people want to worship, and one must, one should not worship anything that is foreign as God. Worship as God that which came with you, to with this life force the vital breath and this consciousness together. That is the God anyone can know. Any other God is alien to you. Then you worship the power which gives one sentience, the feeling, the sense of existing. The body is merely the sustenance for this life force. See this life force come consciousness as the supreme God. Visitor, God is within you. Maharaj, God is within you, but I do not mean within literally. That which exists in and of itself is God. Consciousness and the life force together, that is God. And that is one with the body, because the body is the sustenance for this consciousness and life force together. You can't divide them. And then when a person is called dead, this is what happens. 
the life force within has gone out and merged with the air outside. That is all that has happened. What does one act on? One acts on the thought which is produced by the mind. And what is mind? Mind is the working principle of this life force. The life force merely goes on. The consciousness and the life force merely watch. The action takes place through the mind. Mind gives rise to thought, the thought is interpreted, and then the action takes place. Visitor, but the mind creates desires, and we should be careful of those right. Maharaj, you cannot control them. All you can do is to purify this life force, and thereafter whatever is produced by the life force are the thoughts and the desires. They may be better desires. So the only thing one can do is to purify this life force. All our actions, the way the actions in the world go on, is on account of the mind. The mind creates the problems. Then the problems are converted into words and the words produce the actions. God's name is repeated in the mantra. The mantra refers to a particular thought, and when that name is repeated constantly, the life force assumes the qualities of that on which the meditation takes place. So thereby the life force gets purified and becomes that on which the meditation takes place. Visitor, so in order to purify the life force and the consciousness, is meditation necessary? Maharaj, meditation and repeating the name are both necessary but only for the limited purpose of purifying the life force. I repeat that is no jhana. But for this purification, this is the means, and it has to be done. Whatever knowledge you gain refers only to that consciousness which is your birthright and with which anyone is born and which gives one sense of existence. Knowledge is based on that consciousness. That is why I will not now let people stay on for a long time, because then the self is taken as their own. It is better that they listen and then go, and let that knowledge with which they have been imbibed work through the life force. The words are the language of the life force. Whatever words and actions take place at their origin lies the life force. So it is essentially that life force which does everything in the world. Thus the consciousness works through the life force, and the life force works through the mind and the word which is the basis for all actions. Therefore no individual has yet come into the picture. And when this life force settles down into this consciousness, and therefore no longer works through the world, it settles down into what is generally known as samadhi because there is no objectivization. But if the life force and consciousness are present, then the world exists. If there is no life force and consciousness, the world does not exist. The world is a creation of only these two. People pray to God, but what is God? God is a creation of this consciousness and life force, some concept to which people pray. Therefore pray to that which creates the concept of God. Visitor, is there an evolution in man as taught in science? Maharaj, yes, you can accept it as a concept. But what do you call man a human being, what is that? And what is it in the presence of which there is a human being, and in the absence of which there is no human being? And what is it in the presence of which there is life and a human being can function, and in its absence you will say the man is dead? Visitor, Consciousness Maharaj, Consciousness, the Life Force In the absence of the life force, consciousness is not there. Visitor, is consciousness evolving also? Maharaj, consciousness is present throughout and manifests itself in various forms. The light that you see is itself the light of the consciousness. What is his consciousness and whatever is cannot be anything other than the consciousness. Visitor, is this any different today than thousands of years ago? Maharaj, give up this idea of individuality and what is now has always been thousands and millions of years ago aeons ago and now what is still is, but give up the identification with an individual. This what is will always be there. 
give good attention to what is being said, hang on to it without any other concepts interfering. You use the word science. What do you really understand by that term? A study of what? Visitor, life and matter have regular patterns. There are rules of combinations and laws that we seem to live under. For example, the laws of physics that govern movement and the laws of chemistry that govern combinations of different substances and so on. Their study is what I understand by science. Maharaj, as I understand it, science is really nothing but analytical and a bent of mind towards research, maybe in regard of anything. A search born out of curiosity about something. I consider science as going deeper and deeper into the nature of a particular subject. How long can the best of scientists keep his life force going? Does he have any control over it? No one has control over his life force. The life force has come spontaneously, and it will go spontaneously. In deep sleep consciousness is resting, but the life force goes on. At the end of life, the life force merges with the air outside but does not die. Chapter 10 And Suffering by Stabilizing in the State Before Words Maharaj, the topic on which I talk which is the discovery of one's true nature is extremely difficult, and what is my true nature is your true nature. The subject can see and think and analyze an object, but the subject cannot see itself. That is where the difficulty arises. The scientist can analyze an object. But how can he analyze his own being? Visitor, but he analyzes himself as an object. Science is the analysis of one object by another without ever reaching the subject. Maharaj, I told you the scientist cannot make a discovery about himself. But the scientist can make a million discoveries about another object. What is a scientist? The scientist is such as only the essence of the food which he has eaten. So how can he do any research on the nature of that essence which he is? Only the greater, the more fundamental, can fully understand the lesser. The food essence that is the scientist, when that is dried up, where is the scientist? From now on, I will give you only hints, so you better give full attention to those. And when I have given you those hints, I will pack you up so that you will have to work on your own. I will stop feeding people. One can only give directions. So on this matter, ask questions by all means, then you will get answers. But I am basing the questions not on your identity, otherwise there will be trouble again. Visitor, as I understand it, the quality of the consciousness is one, that is derived from the essence of the food substance. But the food substance itself cannot change the quality of the consciousness, it only supports it, is that correct? Maharaj, yes this food which supports the consciousness is so small infinitesimal in fact that it cannot change anything about the consciousness since consciousness is limitless. Therefore, how can there be any change in the nature or measurement of consciousness? Are you going to manufacture some questions? Laughter. Visitor. The consciousness creates curiosity as well as other desires, and it creates the desire to know oneself. How do you separate one from another? Maharaj, what is that you that you are thinking of? Give me a sample of you when the life force and the consciousness are not there. Who is this you other than the life force and the consciousness who wants to do something? If you have some image about yourself other than the consciousness and the life force, give us an instance. Who is this who wants to do thing or other? The good and bad desires have spontaneously arisen in consciousness. Visitor, they create images of themselves. Maharaj, who is this who? Other than the sum total of this consciousness and life force, there is no individual. Maharaj, you have to look for the ultimate meaning of yourself. Paramatman, but when you are identified with the body, you cannot find yourself. Ultimately the real self is your true nature, and you are not the body. Your true nature cannot be known through the senses, 
but all the senses derive meaning from your true nature. Whatever is visible to you has meaning because of that the true reality. Visitor, certain things that you are saying have been recorded in the scriptures, the Upanishads and others. But at this moment, I am not interested in knowing that. My heart seems to have become sort of hungry for grace. There is a conflict in that some say you have to work hard yourself, you have to contain your senses, you have to bring your mind into focus and all that, you have to give up the habit of this and that. Others say that the company of saints, for example, when you sit in the company of Ramana Maharshi, will resolve everything. Hence I seem to have come to Maharaj with the expectation that something may happen out of the vibrations of this room. The mind expects that something will happen which dissolves all problems. Maharaj, if you understand whatever is being said here then you get peace satisfaction. But that satisfaction has no design in it. Visitor, I am still not clear. All the scriptures and saints the advice you have to put that first. You have to control your mind. Suppose my mind wants to do something. The sages say don't run after the vagaries of the mind. Control your mind, close your eyes. Watch, watch your breath. As Maharaj explains, the state of I amness and all that. But mind seems to be lazy. It does not want to do that, it just wants the grace. So can I have this grace from Maharaj? I am helpless. Lazy and also restless. And here I come with an expectation that out of the vibrations and words from Maharaj, something should heal my mind, clarify my mind. Maharaj, these concepts which you have told us about just now, these are the concepts of a Mimakshu, one who is desirous of liberation. That is the second stage. But when you come here I tell you that you are not the body, you are the consciousness. Then you enter the third stage, that is called the sadhana. From the way you talk, I recognize that you are in the stage of a Mimakshu, one who wants liberation but still identifies with the body. Have full faith in the Kiru, who tells you that you are not the body but are the consciousness that I love. So you are formless. When you are given the mantra and you chant it, the meaning of that word becomes clear to you slowly. In that state you don't identify with the body but take yourself as the consciousness, which is no form. Visitor, so it is necessary to take a mantra and to be initiated by that teacher? Maharaj, it is necessary and it is not necessary also to get the initiation of a mantra. But by accepting a mantra from a guru, the meaning of that becomes one with your vital breath, and the vital breath gets purified and in turn you get purified, and you become the meaning of that mantra. That means you are not the body form, you are the manifest principle. The vital breath is your expression, everything is formless. The sadhaka or the seeker who takes initiation from a guru is sustained by the body principle. He is not the body but he is that consciousness. The consciousness is sustained by the body principle. The simple meaning of mantra is the principle containing the body, the consciousness. I am that consciousness, the dynamic manifest principle Brahman. I am which has no design, form or color. This consciousness is all-powerful. Whatever image or concept you hang on to it, its meaning will be delivered into your consciousness and your consciousness become that. Visitor Right now my consciousness is a bundle of suffering, hankering for grace. My teacher tells me to accept a mantra, chant the mantra and become one with the consciousness of the mantra. But the mind is lazy, out of arrogance or whatever. Out of the habit of comparison, whether to take aid or not to take aid, whether to take it from this guru or that guru. That is all part of the wavering mind. It does not want to accept or reject anybody. It just wants grace without putting in any effort, without paying any price. It wants a free gift. Maharaj, how dare you say it is idle or lazy. What the mind knows is out of the vital breath. Is the vital breath idle, lazy, or indulgent? Who told you that the mind is idle? Visitor, 
I am saying it is both, it is lazy, it is greedy. Maharaj, that is the aspect of your body, not the mind. Can anything be as active as the mind? Visitor, mind is lazy and restless. It is restless after getting things from outside material as well as spiritual without paying the price for it. Maharaj, I am sitting here and my mind has gone to Pune. So how dare you call the mind inactive indolent? You might say its activity is futile but it is not lazy by any means. Visitor, I am sorry I have used the wrong word. What I would like to say instead of lazy is that mind is greedy, it does not want to pay the price and wants the gift, the gift of grace. Maharaj, that is your concept from the body-mind state. You are interpreting your mind through a body sense. Nothing is as active as the mind. Visitor, but Maharaj has not answered my question. My question is, I want grace without paying the price. The end of suffering I want. Maharaj says, take my mantra, meditate upon it, live with it. I don't want all those things. Maharaj, why did you come? Visitor, because I am suffering and I want the end of suffering. Maharaj, and why also did you pay the price of coming? Visitor, that I can't help. Maharaj, the basic advice for you is to give up spirituality, do some social work for the benefit of mankind. Visitor, but I have the experience that doing social work is not possible for me without first ending my own suffering. Maharaj, you will see the end of your suffering provided you see or that. Visitor, I have been told that my mind, not the consciousness, is really made up of several parts, the physical part, the intellectual part, and the feelings or the emotional part. This is the current picture we have of ourselves. Maharaj, to produce the source of the mind. I am, you must have the ingredient of the five elemental juice. If that is available, the sprouting of the mind can begin with I am. You know you are before even speaking the words I am. Subsequent to the knowingness I am, you say I am by words. Visitor, but the I am lies behind what I currently see and that is made up of desires from the other parts of my makeup. Maharaj, are you not even before you have spoken the words I am? Visitor, yes of course. Maharaj, stay put there only. There begins your spirituality, the foremost you I am without words before the beginning of words. Be there. Out of that grows the experience I am. Visitor, then I am is the observer. Being is the observer, right? Maharaj, witnessing happens to that principle which is prior to your saying the words I am. There is no such thing as deliberate witnessing. Witnessing just happens by itself. You must also analyze death, the meaning of this common parlance. At the time that death occurs, the vital breath quits the body, gradually leaves the body. At the same time as the vital breath, the mind and the language also go out. Simultaneously, this quality of I am, this savaguna, the quality of beingness, also departs or goes into oblivion. Only I, the Absolute, remains. They put there only, nothing happens to I, the Absolute. Upon the so-called death, this Savaguna, this quality of beingness, merges into the no-beingness state. There is no tangibility left for that I am-ness. The feeling of is no longer there. It has become Nirvana. There is no more sample of beingness. So what happens to that quality of beingness? It merges into whatever the state that was there, which is the witnessing of the departure of the vital breath and this guina, this quality of beingness. It merges into the absolute state. Visitor, does this happen with everyone or just with those who realize I am? Maharaj, it happens in totality for all. In that state there is no accountability of I amness also. So where is the question of I and others? In that state into which the quality of beingness merges, there is no I am-ness. So you can't talk of others on the I am. 
To attend to this, you should meditate on the meditative state. You should not meditate on what is, but you should meditate on meditation. So when you really meditate on the meditator or on that meditative state, whatever is not fit for meditation will drop away. And only the meditator will remain without object for meditation. It is easy for anyone to meditate on what is when that is an object. But it is difficult for one to meditate on oneself. The meditator cannot meditate on another meditator if the latter is originally himself. But that is to be attained. In the process of meditation on the meditator, the meditation subsides. It is no longer meditation, it transcends meditation. If you are able to meditate on the meditator, on yourself, all the riddles will be solved for you whatever they may be. Coming to the point, don't be obsessed by what is. Meditate on the meditator. Presently, I am accused of a serious disease. I am investigating the nature of that disease and to whom is that disease. First of all, I start with the body which is the five elemental play. The latter is there provided the consciousness is there. I want to investigate about this consciousness which is sustained by the five elemental body, would it have autonomy? As a result of this investigation, I find that this I am-ness, which is the product of the five elements, does not have the exclusive authority to perpetuate itself. The sickness is subjected to this body, which again is the expression of the consciousness. This sickness has no tangible form. Similarly, the consciousness has no tangible form. It does not have a permanent feature, it is only temporary, therefore it is not the truth. The one who observes the consciousness is the truth. So he does with his evidence in the Absolute, who is in a position to observe all this play, all the unreality. And in that unreality the sickness is happening. In that fashion, this entire show is eliminated as a big hoax including the consciousness, the five elemental world and the sickness. Therefore the sickness has no real existence because this consciousness has no existence in reality. This is the way I dismiss my so-called sickness. Can anyone develop any concept in this fashion? Here is a particular example as to how I follow that course of the meditator meditating on the meditator. Don't give scope for worries to obsess you. When the medical consultant pronounced judgment of the illness, he told me, you should take my treatment, although in spite of it certain symptoms will occur. Blood will come out of your nose and throat and what not. So many things he said. He will be a little less, but all other things will take their course. So I said no, in the next five months or so, nothing will happen to me. The original judgment was so serious that it would have depressed any patient. All the symptoms should have become apparent very soon. But so far nothing has happened. What is it due to? I was not meditating on the judgment of the doctor. I was meditating on the meditator. Therefore, so far there has been no effect of that judgment on me. Let anything happen in your body. The state put in your confidence that you are the manifest Brahman where you are the absolute. The ideal spiritual seeker must he independent of all external forces. He should not hold on to anyone's apron strings, but should depend only on himself. People are always taken for a ride. A certain concept is given to them, and they hang on to it for dear life. Then that concept comes to fruition and gives results. But that is an objective achievement and is not going to last long. I am asking you to abide in your own self, this primary concept that you are. You abide in that and see what happens. Are there any questions? Maharaj, the memory of the body is not your identity, the knowledge I am is your present identity. Stabilize in it. From the bodily standpoint, you can talk a lot, thinking that it is knowledge but it is not. Visitor, the problem stems from the other way. Maharaj says in his teaching, stay with the I am-ness. And I say that mind is restless, 
My mind is not capable of staying in this I amness. Meharaj, your understanding that you are the body, the problem can never be solved. Visitor, I know this and intellectually I can understand it, but actually I can't help it. Maharaj, you are prior to your intelligence. Visitor, I am not interested in any other statement that Maharaj is giving. Maharaj, why don't you stop repeating the same thing? You are uttering words like an apprentice entering the spiritual trade. I want to convert you into an earnest seeker. Visitor, there is the statement God is all-pervasive, consciousness is all-pervasive. Therefore God is consciousness, to see God is to be God. But I am not that, is that correct? Interpreter, when you say, I am not that, Maharaj will ask you, what do you mean by I am? Visitor, neti neti, not this, not that. Interpreter, he will ask you to which you refer when you say I am not that. Which is that I am? Visitor, one's source of consciousness. That's the thrust of my question. Interpreter, this I am is consciousness, is it not? Visitor, yes. Interpreter, and you say consciousness is all pervasive. God is all pervasive. Therefore, God equals the consciousness, equals the I am. Now, what is your question? Visitor, the question was to see God is to be God, but I am not that. Is that a correct statement to make? Meharaj, you are correct. I need not go in upon that further. The way you understand is correct. Though generally I am not being given to agree. Any further questions? I will explain why I am inclined not to agree with people. I will elaborate on that. You want to hang on to certain words, you interpret them in such a fashion in your own words and you hang on to those words. You must remember that you are prior to the words, kill the words. Don't frame your knowledge, don't condition it by words. Be prior to the words. Interpreter, I told Maharaj, now I understand why you always disagree with whatever we say because he never wants us to stick to any words, any statement. He wants us to stabilize prior to words. That is why he always disengages us from the words to which we are clinging as our knowledge. He directs us to stabilize prior to words. That is very important. Meharaj, the disease has no name and form. It has no true foundation because the I am also is an illusion. So you must always try to understand in this fashion, what is my true meaning? Your true meaning cannot be grasped or captured by any words. You can never be equated with any words because you are prior to words. Words are subsequent to you.